Worm is a web serial by J.C. McRae, also known as Wildbow. You can read Worm in its original format by visiting parahumans.wordpress.com or donate to Wildbow's Patreon at patreon.com slash wildbow. This story isn't intended for young or sensitive readers. Readers who are on the lookout for trigger warnings are advised to give Worm a pass. For a complete list, check the description for all of Worm's trigger warnings. Brockton Bay. Who let the dogs out? Who, 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 who? And by dogs, I mean the personal identities of all the white supremacists in the area. <laughs> it's Coil. Get doxed, bitches. Um, basically, who knew that Coil's power after all this was just doxing people? Yeah. I Man. didn't know that, you know, I forgot the whole part of the story where we find out that Coil is a Discord moderator. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, really. Actually, that really makes a lot of sense. It does. <laughs> that checks out. Skin well, suit you. and everything. <laughs> thank you, Hi. Alan. And uh, welcome to episode seven of uh, Brockton Bay Book Club, where we are diving into the web serial worm by Wildbow, and going arc by arc, discussing it, and uh, having a fun time. We are down uh, our two uh, first-time readers this week, so we, we don't have Taylor and Kat with us, but that's all right. It means that all of us uh, experienced readers can spoil everything. Oh, no spoiling. <laughs> Okay, so when no, we find out that Brian not. is secretly Alex's dad. No! Yeah, did y'all think? <laughs> I mean, you know, honestly, I was surprised to to, you know, find out that uh Lisa has been in love with Danny this entire time. Oh my god. Yeah, like looking back, it makes all. so much it sense. Makes so much sense. Stop. He's obviously beekeeping age. <laughs> 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 okay, now that is what we're all okay. looking for in a man. It's a beekeeper. You know what? Right? That's, That's a, what we all you know, want. Sign me up. <laughs> you, Hannah, you know? I know. You know, we were talking about beekeeping classes. We're actually, we're actually thinking about signing up for beekeeping. I just need more zaddy energy. It's I need true. to absorb it. Well, it took <laughs> us not even three minutes to get off topic here. <laughs> That's a merch yeah, shirt idea I've ever heard. Welcome one. to the daddy podcast. Yes. All dads <laughs> all the time. How do you Wait, like your daddies? Michael had a great point, though. Daddy. Yes, that is. There's a merch idea in there somewhere. Yeah, for sure. <gasps> I'm gonna figure it out. <laughs> oh well, let's go. Let's go ahead and dive in. And no, we're not spoiling anything, obviously, for anyone who is reading along with us. Uh, but we are gonna have some fun. So again, I sound like a broken record every time I say this, but we've got another packed episode. Oh my god! Yeah, uh, so much to get through with this chapter. Um, as always, uh, Hannah, do you have some? summaries for us maybe i think these first couple chapters can maybe group together a little bit yes yes definitely uh yeah so okay so this arc had uh 12 chapters plus an interlude so it was pretty long i think the longest arc we've we've read so far um but mm -hmm. chapter one we start off with taylor and brian doing a little uh close quarter combat training um and alec talks a little bit about his dad who is revealed to be heartbreaker uh, Taylor heads out with Bitch in an attempt to bond with doggies because doggies make everything better. Um, and I'm, I think I'm probably going to group this together with the, the next couple of chapters, if that's okay with you guys. Uh, yeah. Chapter two, yeah. we are uh, at Bitch's dog shelter where Taylor uh, and her kind of hang out. We see that dynamic a little bit with Bitch and her dogs. Taylor finds worms in one of the dogs, serious because she can sense weird wormy buggy things um and uh 
we kind of learn a little bit more about Bitch's power there with how she can manipulate her dogs. And then in chapter three, Empire 88, a bunch of, a bunch of, couple, a couple of the Empire 88 thugs show up uh, and threaten Bitch, try to run her off. And Taylor makes a mock human with her bugs, which is fun new power thingies, which is just such a delight. Uh, and then chapter four, Brian shows up to offer a bit of assistance. Bitch offers Taylor a just fuck him advice, which is, you know, <laughs> what we all need for relationships, I guess. Uh, they head back to the loft where we reveal that Coil has released all the information, has outed the Empire 88 secret identities, and now everyone knows who they are. And I'm going to stop there for that. So chapters one through four. Mm. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Good little intro there. I, I love the way this arc kicks off. It feels very uh, montage as they're rounding up the gang members and uh, the banter between uh, Taylor and Brian uh, are, are really fun. Uh, I don't know. It felt, it felt very much like a, like a silly, not sitcom is the wrong word, but like, a, like something you'd see on, on a funny television show. Yeah, I, I love any time Taylor and Brian get to do a little bit of sparring together. That's so fun. And I, I realize it's probably very cliche to, to have them do that in, you know, books and movies and whatnot with superheroes and stuff. But it's just so fun. And, you know, of course, there's always the... <laughs> but I think Lisa makes a comment where she's just like, oh, you know, you just gonna stare at her. You just lay on the floor. What are you, what are you doing over there? Like, you gonna, you know, get up and get to work? It's very cute. Yeah, my uh, my note here just says hot Brian can pin me to the <laughs> ground any day. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I'd spar uh, with Brian. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who wouldn't? I um while I do enjoy that, finding out about Alex uh oh. terrifying mm. father. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Is definitely a significant part of this. Um and I I, I feel like this is one of the first times we're really seeing getting to know him. And I think that it's very revealing for his character because he's been very aloof, very unemotional, um, rarely showing any kind of either positive or negative emotion, just kind of very flat in his emotions. And I think that we see now, like this makes it clear, right? He had a dad whose whole power was emotion manipulation. Mm-hmm. And it wouldn't surprise mm-hmm. me if, Alec is essentially um, dead to emotions, naturally. Um, Maybe not completely, but just to this idea of, you know, you've experienced so much artificial ups and downs that now you don't have normal emotions anymore. Um, And so I don't know. I think that that's an interesting idea to consider with Alec. Uh, Sort of like how in the past we've talked about with... um, does Taylor have bug brain? Does Rachel have dog brain? Um, you know, how do powers affect your mental state? I wonder if maybe too, in sort of an opposite way, because it's coming externally, it's that, you know, like Alex been nurtured into not having emotions because that's how he had to survive. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, that's, yeah. It also helps, like, I like that it gave him a little bit of um, kind of, reasoning for being with the group too. Like, I feel like all the other characters, we've, we've sort of gotten tastes of what their motives are and why they're here, but haven't had quite had that with Alec yet. Mm. So anything that kind of gave him some more agency in the story has been kind of nice to explore. Yeah, it's actually been him and Lisa as well. Mm-hmm. I haven't really, haven't really gotten a whole lot on her. That's true. Yeah. That's true. Lisa doesn't tend to offer up too much information, but I do like that we're kind of seeing a little bit more with Alec here and getting, you know, because we've had our one on one moment with Brian last arc at the apartment. And we've had a one on one moment with Lisa a little bit when we were all shopping. I keep saying we as if, you know, we're in the story, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but, but this is kind of a moment with Alec. And this isn't like a Taylor and Alec only, but this is giving us a more of an insight into Alec, which I do, I, gosh, I really do like. And with, with getting into a lot more uh, uh, powers and uh, capes and what they can do, I really do feel like this is the arc where I had to sit down and want to, I wanted to make a spreadsheet just to keep track of everybody because there are so many new uh, 
names and faces that we're really getting into this arc and will in the next one as well. But uh, hearing about Heartbreaker too is just Mm -hmm. interesting thinking about parents and their children and what passing on powers can do, you know? Yeah. 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 That's that's a good, that's a good point to bring up because they, we've, the story's kind of touched on that a bit Mm -hmm. here and there with like powers passing uh, more easily from parents to children and things like that. Um, Brian tells Aisha that, uh, you know, hey, he, he alludes that he's had a conversation with her because she's more likely to get powers because he has them. So it kind of runs in the family is the thought, things like that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, definitely yeah. gives well, we a little know that, bit more. We know that Glory Girl, her mom is right, also right. powered spend and a, shows a little, up in this arc, doesn't she? Yep. We spend yeah. a little bit of time mm-hmm. talking about her laser dream. Yes, and, uh, laser dream. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and, uh, and what's the and, no laser dreams? Her uh, laser dreams. The friend. Her cousin. What is the mom's. What is the mom's name? They they call her um, mommy photon or something. Uh, lady, lady photon. Lady, lady, lady photon. photon. Yeah. Also, I think lady photon is her aunt. I believe. Is lady photon her aunt? Yeah. Huh. It's okay. lady photon. Michael? I'm pretty sure is her aunt. Her we need to know. Niece, her cousin <laughs> is laser dream. Right. And yeah. uh, her parents are, we haven't met them yet, but Brandish and, oh, sh- oh yeah, you're right. Brandish and I can't remember the mom's name. Taylor does mention at one point though that that um, their powers are similar, which makes me think like this, there's a whole family of superheroes here. There's, there's a, you know, because they are family, there's a weird sense of sharing or having similar powers too and Mm -hmm. then what you said nick earlier about the whole like if so if heartbreaker is manipulating emotions and alec as his son is manipulating kind of like the nervous system it's like the interior of a person so it's either their nervous system or for heartbreaker sense your brain and your brain chemistry and your Mm -hmm. emotional state um but that's it's it's very interesting to think about alec's emotional state I think what you said, Nick, really, really hit it now on the head. Yeah. 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 But it is sort of that um, with this whole inheritance of powers thing, you know, the classic debate of nature versus nurture um, mm-hmm. in a weird yeah. way. While, while obviously there's a plethora of evidence, it seems like nurture tends to matter a lot more than nature in many ways. There is still parts of our nature that affect how we grow up and who we are. Um, And in the same way now, we see that in an even more extreme way with capes because not only is there the nurture and you have horrible people like Heartbreaker who, you know, run a cult basically with harems of women. Um, But then you also have literally the nature in the sense of, you know, hey, my dad was a cape and odds are I'll probably be one too if I have a good trigger event. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there's something being passed down there almost genetically. Um, Yeah. So yeah, um, the issues that, I don't know, just sort of an interesting continuance of that idea of nature versus nurture there with the capes and with Mm -hmm. superheroes. I just find it interesting too that even though it seems like superheroes are relatively, I guess not relatively new, how long long has it been since Scion appeared? Like 20 years? His first appearance was in the Uh, late 80s. Late 80s? So like 30 30 30 years. 30, 30 and change, yeah. 30 and change, yeah. So even though it's only been 30 years, the fact that we have this many second generation heroes is kind of interesting too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about like us now with the internet, like how long our generations have had the internet and like, mm-hmm. you know, existing with the internet in its current state, which, you know, is That's true. whatever, but it, technically capes are older than the internet. Oh, well, I guess. I guess that's a good <laughs> yeah, that's a good yeah. point. Which is kind of cool, but yeah, there's yeah. a there's a lot of fun, yeah, fun thought experiments with that. You could yeah. you, you could talk for a while. I'll say it since Taylor's not here. Nine eleven. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was for you, we, got, uh, we got to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Oh boy. Going back to Alec, I, I thought it was real interesting that you know Taylor does the mental math in her head and is like, oh my gosh. Alec is the most experienced oh, cape we have on the yeah. team. Yeah, that's so oh, interesting. Oh, right, right. And Andy's yeah. killed somebody too. Yes, he's the, our, our other murderer. Oh, yeah. yeah, good. Wow, yeah, we jumped right over that. But yeah, exactly. We finally have our, our murderers now. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I'm not going to lie, and maybe this is just the detachment from, you know, the outside. I really didn't get, like, murdering is what you're hung up on? Yeah. Really? <laughs> I know. <laughs> well. Like, I know you want that to be a little bit of a mystery, but I- I'll be honest, that you could accidentally murder someone like five times over in this world. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, on. I feel like that's the point they make with, uh, with bitch's whole thing and her, and her, her manslaughter. I don't think anyone would really call it murder, but like, it has to be so common when a child first gets yeah. their powers and doesn't know what they have or how to use them. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. that there's probably a whole team of therapists for for right. that type of PTSD, <laughs> well, accidental I mean, you murder. Would, you would hope so, but the indication seems to be from, right. from the fact that there's more villains than heroes, the indication seems to be that, no, there's not those kind of resources. That's a good point. Um, right, yeah. yeah. And with the, oh, I'm so sorry, Nick, I don't mean to cut you off. No, no, I just, that's, I was all. Thinking that's about, all I said. I was thinking about this. With the interlude from uh, arc six, where we, get um, like Canary's little blip Mm -hmm. uh, as she heads to the birdcage, showing kind of the judicial system there, which we talked about last time, but the idea that like, because it is so new, there are systems still being put into place to make, to make things work, to make society function because of capes. So the idea that like, we're still working out our judicial system for capes and you know, how that works and how we're supposed to try them and in the same way that, like, do do they have a system set up for kids in this instance? And, like, mm. when you look at kids that are getting triggered, that are going through triggered events, they're not kids that are in a safe space. And so there probably isn't a safe, you know, a therapist around to help them right. deal or talk about it or handle it in any safe way. So, like, it's it wouldn't be surprising to me if kids that triggered... Or any, I mean, I'm saying kids that trigger, but the capes that trigger have a bad first experience because they're in a bad spot. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I mean, it feels like this is the the easy observation to make, but it it's very it just parallels our like classism here as well. Like, it's if you mm-hmm. have money or it's nepotism, then they're going to be fine. You yeah. know, and yeah, that's they're they're gonna just you know they'll, they'll trigger during a volleyball game <laughs> or something like yeah. that. And right. Everything's gonna be fine. But yeah, but if you're if you're not well off or you don't have the resources or you know things like that, then yeah, you're much more prone to go down the villain route. Which like yeah, like you said, the, the story implies there's uh, quite a bit more uh, villains than there are heroes. And it seems like maybe this society has sort of a taboo towards superpowers. Like it's almost a bad thing, and, and not mm-hmm. necessarily that there's that much evidence of that yet. But you know, obviously, um, superheroes keep their identity secret, and that's a pretty normal thing and standard thing for superhero literature. But usually, the reason why is to protect their family and their loved ones, and that makes sense to an extent. But mm-hmm. which we see in this arc, yeah, which we see in this arc. Um, but there's also kind of this like maybe it's like seen as a bad thing if you have powers, you know, maybe, you know, people will be afraid Mm -hmm. of you. People won't like you. People will think incredibly differently of you. Um, And you almost can become this sort of social pariah if you reveal that you have powers. Um, And so I wonder, and so that's why new wave is so rare because they're like, well, we don't care what the world thinks of us. We're going to show everybody you can have Mm -hmm. a public identity and have powers. But so I think, I wonder if maybe there's a sense of, you know, if you're young and you're already kind of insecure and then you have something terrible enough happen to you to trigger an event. I mean, are you going to tell people about that? Like the fact that, yeah. oh, hey, now yeah. I can, you know, I can suddenly shoot lasers out of my eyes that can kill people. Right. Yeah, you're not just going to go and tell somebody that. I mean, I think yeah. of a lot of yeah. the people, I don't, I don't think there's a taboo in this world, um, personally. I think if you are in a good situation and you get powers, I think most of those people once they've, you know, had a second to deal with it, just go straight to the wards. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think I think it's not so much that there's a taboo uh, from society. I think society actually has the opposite of a taboo. They've got an obsession with heroes. Yeah, yeah um, that's possibly true too. Which is kind of why, like, I don't think there... Are there any common criminals doing things? 
<laughs> or is everybody kind of have to fall under? Like you have to, right? Because like, what are you going to do? Get beat up by a hero? Like the only way you're going to prevent that is if you have a villain on your side. So like, mm-hmm. if you're the average criminal, you know, existing wanna... now, yeah, you're probably way more on your guard about stuff. No, that's a good point. You're right. That's a good point. Um, well, there is, there is some, there is definitely some element of of tabooedness. I mean, just for the simple fact that that Taylor thought it was going to be better for her in the long run to it, like continue to be bullied awfully by these yeah. girls than out herself as someone with powers. Like yeah. that was that would have made her life worse. She was talking like, "There's no way I could use my powers against them. My my life would get worse because of that." So, yeah. but I mean, her situation is a little different. Obviously, being being the victim there, it's harder for her to think straight. But I, I think it. I think it. It's you see both sides of that. I think it depends on where you come from. But yeah. uh, I mean, I how team, long did right Taylor well. have between her, you know, the the trigger event and her going out on her first? Heroing venture. It's like a. It's like a two, couple months. Three. Oh, is it months? I was, oh, I was, was going to say a couple weeks. I thought it was a month. I thought she goes. She gets locked up for like two weeks, and mm-hmm. then she comes back and maybe has a month of like essentially prepping, and then she goes mm-hmm. out and does it, which is how I think. Probably most people do it. Yeah. 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 Like, and then, honestly, she's just out there auditioning. Essentially, she like she wants to see if she can <laughs> right. do it, and then she's auditioning to join, you know, to get noticed, and then maybe picked up. You know, she wants to <laughs> get her toe picked in the water the too, good guys. Hopefully, but yeah, yeah, right. exactly. Like, but but her idea also is like, hey, can I do this? Because I don't want to get, I don't want to out myself as a hero, get picked up by the heroes, and then go, ooh, I don't want to make a career of this you know, a la Canary mm-hmm. style. Yeah. Like, Canary's like, I just want to sing. Like, I don't want to, I'm not here to play powered police officer. Right. You know, <laughs> Taylor's not sure if she wants to do that. She knows she, like, she thinks she wants to, but she also is probably going out there to test the waters. It mm-hmm. turns out she's got a knack for stabbing people and cutting off genitals. So, <laughs> <laughs> something comes natural. Rotting there. off genitals. Let's yeah. be clear here. Happens she didn't cut that. anybody's no, 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 genitals no. off. She rotted no, no, no. them off. <laughs> she rotted them she off. Cut off a the toe. first time. Gouged out some eyes, but. She straight up hits a guy in the dick with like. Uh, <laughs> well, again, cut is a strong word. No, no, she took a freak. Okay, you know, there's a lot of things she did, and if you consult the "What the Fuck Taylor" episode, you know, fucking going after genitals with uh, with her baton, stabbing you know toes off, yeah, fucking eyes, yeah, a lot she's, going on there. It's pretty dangerous. Uh, just just to clear up the timeline, Taylor triggered in January of 2011. And went out and fought long April 10th. So four months. Holy cow. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It was a few months. I mean, if Which knowing Taylor, I, I was going to say knowing yeah. Taylor, that seems right. She's, she tends to think things through and like wait rather than just like storm into things. So that makes sense. You know, she takes some time. She wants to figure out her costume. She figures out the bug. She has the spiders create the costume. Like there, there's a step, step process there, which I'm and she did, not really surprised. Um, so in February, maybe this is what you're thinking about, and in February is when she started training because she started mm. running every morning after mm. um, Sophia sent mm. those boys after. So, yeah. And then after that, then she went out. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, let's move on. <laughs> so, arc, or chapter two. At the dog shelter. <laughs> we can this move is, through these This chapters. is my, my doggy chapter, and I just got to say, as, as someone who just loves dogs, this is like such a such a happy place with all these happy little doggos and they're just running around chasing toys and I just oh it makes me so happy so uh, for a lot of these chapters I have one note uh yeah actually a lot of these chapters I have one singular note this one is bitch has the tism but only with dogs <laughs> bitch um, what <laughs> Like, like, bitch is smart. We get a sign yeah. that, like, bitch is actually really smart, but mm-hmm. only with dogs. 
<laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. Like, she can count to twos and barely tie her shoes, but boy, when it comes to knowing the internal digestive system of a canine, she yeah, has yeah. got a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, she knows she knows everything that has to do with them. And she, I, I do love to kind of build off of that. I love the um, the intelligence she shows to Taylor throughout all of that, and she understands their dynamics, their behavior, and where they need it. Who's trained well? Like she just has such yeah. a good street mm-hmm. sense about dogs. Yeah, and she that, knows their uh, stories too, which I like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it implied, am I misremembering this, is it implied that before Bitch triggered that she worked with dogs? Was she like working at animal shelters or things like that? I want to say that, but I can't no, remember. No, I think it was she was just around so. dogs. They were like yeah. in the houses that she was at. And she felt kind of a kinship to them because a lot of the people treated the dogs um the same as the foster like kids. people, but the people like dogs if in that sense. Oh, okay. Gotcha. She had yeah. this weird if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, it sounds right. No, but I do love uh I love the Taylor bitch uh about to say romance friendship. <laughs> <laughs> you were thinking it though. It you were thinking it. So but uh Taylor was thinking it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, their little back and forth is so interesting because Taylor is, you know, doing her best to try and like relate to Rachel in a way that feels dog-like of the whole, uh, you know, questioning the pack leader and like standing up to them, but not standing up too much and like showing them you mean business and like the conversation that, that like bitch tells her like, oh, well, you want to be useful? Like go shovel dog shit. And Taylor's like, fuck no. Like I came to help you. <laughs> so let me help you. Don't just like, push me off. I'm not just here to like do your chores, which I think is interesting because if I had been in that position, I probably probably would have been like, yeah, sure. Okay, cool. I'll just go. Where's the shovel? I'll, yeah. Uh-huh. Let me go take care of that for you. But <laughs> Taylor, you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Taylor like looks at her and is like, Hey, I'm here to help. So let me help. Don't, don't just like push me to the side and give me busy work. And I think yeah. that like that little exchange is so interesting. I love it. It's so good. I think that like, there, I, it makes me want to know more about like pack mentality and like the idea of like how an alpha operates in a group where you can challenge them without necessarily, you know, uh, uh, telling them you want to take their place. And, and that's what I feel like Taylor's doing. Like she's saying like, Hey, I have value. I'm challenging you as, you know, kind of pack leader of the, all these dogs and everything. I'm challenging you, but I don't want to take your place. I just want you to value me as as an important yeah. part of, you know, the team In or this order group to or as a friend. Deal with bitch. You gotta talk like a bitch. <laughs> as in well, and a to, big dog. <laughs> and talking about sure. their conversations, I do think that's one of um one of Wild Bo's uh stronger elements to his writing is these conversations feel so lifelike like they're so Mm -hmm. real and like you're saying like i think a lot of people's responses if a bitch was like hey you want to do something go shovel the shit be like yeah that's what kind of we're expecting taylor to say because that feels like the natural response but it doesn't have to be and it's very human for it to not be that and for her to still like because and and really taylor's character does say like it makes sense that she says no like she said no and it's like oh yeah Why, why would she do that and it it works so well, and I, I love the way he writes dialogue between characters because it feels so alive when they're not saying like the paint by the numbers, yeah, response that you're you're expecting to hear. Yeah, Which it's really nice fun. to be kind of uh, uh, caught off guard a little bit. Exactly. Really yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I misspoke. I th- thought there was more that uh, Rachel did before um, her powers. Not like the one dog she interacted with was her inciting incident. And after that, she interacted with like taking care of dogs at shelters. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Got it. Interesting. That makes sense. Let's move on. Yeah. Well, I just, I think it's interesting because anytime we have kind of a one on one situation with Taylor or, you know, us as the reader and one of the undersiders or one of these other characters, we're getting more and more peaks into their lives or how they work. And, and, when Taylor is finding the worms in the the dog series, there's we're we're learning two things. We're learning stuff about bitch and her 
how she handles her dogs. Like, because that is something, you know, I'd kind of thought about of like, okay, we have all these dogs. Well, vet bills are going to be sky high. How do you deal with that? And then Taylor learning a little bit more about her and it's not just bugs. Like she can tell that these worms, that these heartworms are all over Sirius and she knows exactly where they are. She can feel that they're not just located to specific areas. She knows that he's invested with them. So that's it. Again, we're kind of, we're expanding the knowledge that we know more of Taylor and seeing Taylor realize it herself as the expansion of her powers isn't just, you know, arachnids, but, you know, worms as well. And then seeing how they handle like, okay, so what do you do when a dog, you have to grow him, make him big, make him big, strong boy, but he's not trained enough to be able to listen to you should you make him as big as a freaking school bus. So, you know, chaining him up, it's giving me very like werewolf vibes of Mm -hmm. like, yep, chain up the werewolf on the full moon so they don't get Mm -hmm. away and hurt people. And I think that's so cool. I love, I, I, the powers are obviously one of my favorite parts of this whole story. And so seeing us, you know, learn more and more about these powers is just, it's catnip for me. I'm loving it. Mm -hmm. Or I guess a good milk bone since we're talking. (laughs) Yeah. Keep it relevant. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) But yeah, I just think that's really cool. Yeah. Agreed. The interaction has been, is, is really fun between them, but they don't get a ton of time Mm-mm. because they get no, they nasty visitors yep. show up. Some of the uh, Empire 88. Empire 88. Yep, mm-hmm. yep, yep. Those bitches. A little Those showdown. Dogs. Really, this is, this is like, when I, when I think of like, uh, you know, controlling your gang or whatever, like you have the big bads, which obviously we've, you know, we know, but these are like, these are punk thug baby children. Like, these little guys show up with their guns and they think they're so goddamn cool and, you know, <laughs> waving their guns around and just like, it's so, ugh, it's so juvenile. Like my dudes, you are, you are going up against bitch, first of all, and Taylor. And, and you're, you're going up against people that fought with your boss and not just your boss, but like the boss of your gang. And you're going to show up and you're going to get all nya, 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 and like mouth off to bit like you guys you guys are not smart not you not suck. smart boys no, you no. suck <laughs> yeah i mean and the whole the whole way like uh, they start talking about like hey the new guys got to earn a stripes Ugh. taking down a taking down a another cape is going to do that yada yada uh, it actually kind of speaks to what we were just talking about earlier like whether or not capes are are, are praised or sort of spat at. Again, it's kind of both. Like you get kind of both from them. Like on the one hand, there's clear hatred for for bitch and and then Taylor when she shows up, like they can't wait to kill her. She's just like a a thorn in their side. But it's also like you get that feeling that there's also that just insane sort of almost jealousy. Like they know they're not as cool as she is kind of thing. And they want to be, right? They want to be like, and 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 feared the way she is, mm. um, yeah. It's it's a it's a really fucked <laughs> fucked up dynamic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it it just that gang initiation aspect of it, and just the oh man, it if you even feel a little bit for dogs, the threats that they make against the dogs Ooh, yes. are just so oh, like, me off. Like oh, so oh mad. you know, it, yeah, it just like, makes you makes kill you mad. It now. Yeah, what did he say? Soak a soak a hot dog in antifreeze and throw it over the side of the fence. Fuck yeah. off, you piece of shit garbage. Like golly. Yeah. Like obviously these films came out um came out or films got these <laughs> stories. I'm all over the place. That was tonight. A good correction. I, I was gonna let us like Yeah, no, I was saying this story it. came out uh, a bit early. Well, you'll see where I'm going, why I said films here in a second, because what I was going to say was clearly Bitch was gonna have the John Wilk Wick films like on repeat, uh, just playing yeah. in the background. <laughs> like that's mm, this oh, would have been man. her one movie that she, she's watching. I do, I do feel like if this if this had been rewritten for more you know modern twenty uh, twenties, is that instead of being bitch, she's just called the Baba Yaga. 
which (laughs) I love it so much. Call her Baba. (laughs) Baba. Baba Yaga. Oh, heck yeah. (laughs) That's great. Yeah. But now it's it's this um, it's this really tense scene though, because although she does have superpowers, Mm -hmm. she does not have superpowers. (laughs) Yeah, yeah and, you know. and definitely doesn't have, you know, faster than a speeding bullet because they all have guns. Yeah. So it's, it's again, we see um, just how there's like different levels of powers, right? Like there are certain mm-hmm. people, certain people that, you know, kind of like Superman. You're not going to pull a gun on Superman. There's no point. But, you know, Batman, you know, he's strong, sure, but there's a chance you could get him. Right. You know, mm-hmm. and it's kind of that too with a bitch, I think, um, like you were saying, Jacob, like this initiation part and like, uh, he's got to earn his stripes. It's like, well, they picked a hero that maybe they thought they could take out. Too bad she's got a crazy bug girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> bug girlfriend, indeed. Your words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, yeah, speaking of, you know, fun new power things that we're learning about every day, I love that she makes this, like, mock human and then, like, yeah. scuttles along the ground so she doesn't get <laughs> shot. Like, oh, my God. And that's where, like, wriggle on the ground, you worm. You worm. <laughs> <laughs> it's worm in time. I was imagining in that scene just, like, worm from- Time. From bitch's perspective, from bitch's perspective, just glancing over and seeing Taylor like bear crawl across the ground behind the swarm of bugs, <laughs> being just like, bugs. "What the hell are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. You know what? Uh, you know what I think too. Um, it's this brief moment where I almost feel like previously we've learned that bitch really does respect Taylor. She just doesn't always show it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because of the way that she thinks and talks and acts, but. Man, if if this scene like doesn't prove once again, I, I think that's part of why I like this whole arc. The thing with um with Sirius and the worms, the things with now this scene with her helping bitch out of this tense situation, like I just I love the subtle ways that Wild Bow shows that bitch really respects Taylor. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, not like as a friend, but as a Kind of this sense of like, I'm glad you're on my side and not theirs, you know? Yeah. Like a teammate that she can actually rely on. Yeah. One of, yeah. One of the dogs. A pack one mate, of, you might oh, say. Oh, pack mate. I love yeah. it. Okay, put that on a t-shirt too. Pack mate. Let's go. I'm here. <laughs> All the merch. Yeah. Also, Taylor, you could have stayed inside and just let that thing go out there. You didn't have to crawl behind it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, I think she kind of did, though. Cool. I think... I think uh, from what I understand from the way it was described, I think she kind of did only because she said that having the bugs hold that structure was really difficult, having them hold each other. So I'm I'm imagining what is happening is she's kind of acting like the base of this really, yeah. really precarious Jenga tower of bugs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know? they're all like gripping each other and she's like, just another couple of feet, guys. Like, come on, guys, also- just hold on. Yeah, like also her her whole idea is to get out there and be able to like get up close enough to somebody that she could disarm them with a gun. It's not just yeah, about yeah. having another yeah. figure out there to maybe intimidate, but to also be able to like to to actually uh, uh, disarm one of these bitch yeah. bucks. Yeah. Which does sort of um, I was thinking about this while reading that reading that part. It, it does sort of build towards this sort of character mo- moment for Taylor, where as a reader really starting to see this I don't know if you want to go so far to say enjoyment but she does uh, pursue these types of encounters boy where, does she enjoy vengeance yeah. wow <laughs> maybe we do say enjoy maybe that maybe that is the right word here um, no, no, I, I, I have a, actually a note in chapter one uh, when she decides to go with bitch to fix the relationship between them Taylor solves problems by putting herself in the middle of things. Mm. See her mm. and bitch. Yeah, that's very <laughs> yeah. true. Taylor is yeah. not a is not a uh, a king in the chess terms. Taylor is a queen. She acts best when she is the in the middle of the chaos. Mm. Mm. Yeah, mm. and she really does kind of have this. Uh, I was going to say opinion or personality, but she has this mindset of the best place for me to be is in the middle, like you just said, but also I can fix it. Like she Mm -hmm. 
sees herself as the solution for a lot of things, as opposed to, I don't know if I can step in right now. I don't know if this is the right time for me to say anything. She feels like she is the solution. So she often will put herself in conversations or in situations like this. Be like, I am, I am the solution to, to help, or I am the solution to ask the right questions, or I am the solution to do the right thing in the face of, you know, all these villains and me being undercover and whatnot, which is yeah, so, actually, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, no, like now that I think about it compared to like how she first fights Lung, which is honestly the smart decision. She is up, <laughs> up behind a wall yes. across the street is capable of hearing and basically seeing everybody through her bugs and can just attack them. Cause what is she going to do? Like right. punch them? No. And then as time goes on, she is just like my complaint yeah. right there. Taylor could have hid behind the wall and let this thing go out. Right. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if it wasn't a matter of like them actually stacked on top of each other, if the bugs were flying in the air in a vaguely humanoid fashion, she could have pulled that off. Yeah. But I think she chose to go out there because she uh -huh. thought that it was better for her to be in the middle of it for some god, you know, ungodly mm -hmm. reason. Well, she's rather than sitting behind the wall where she could just take everybody down without yeah. moving. She's, right. she's a cape with a ranged power who uses it in a melee fashion. Can we agree? Yes. Like she, her power by definition is very sit behind the wall, use your bugs. But she doesn't over and over and over again. She gets right up in people's business and uses in a very melee, you know, melee sense as opposed to a ranged sense. And honestly, it just helps. It makes her continues to make her such a great conduit for the reader. Yes. We we all do that, especially with these types yes. of stories. Where we're like, no, you idiot. Just get out there and do it yourself. Oh my gosh, if I had your powers, the story would be over in a second. Right? Like we, that's how we read these books. So like Taylor just works so well uh, as the POV character because she's doing exactly what we would do in these situations, which is which yes. is really fun. Oh so god. Oh, oh, I love it. And Brian shows up just in time to have missed the entire fight. Good old Brian. Yeah. Hey, but at, <laughs> least, Brian. at least he showed up, though, right? He did. <laughs> Meanwhile, Alec and didn't Lisa even just... Mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't even <bring> <laughs> Alec and Lisa not answering their phones, not showing up. Mm -hmm. So rude. Yeah. Which, you know, expected of Alex, surprised by Lisa. Mm. Yeah. True. Mm -hmm. Truly. But I think we get... Um, a bit of explanation for that later, a couple chapters. Uh, no. Actually, it's 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 the next chapter. It's the next chapter. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Let's talk about bitch and Taylor. Talk about Brian. I was about to say bitch's <laughs> advice to just fuck him. <laughs> yeah, hey, y'all should bang. Mm -hmm. You'll bang later. <laughs> You'll bang later. Be, you'll get it out. Which is so. It makes me really curious about bitch's uh, sex life. Be honest. <laughs> like, it, bitch, is that how you deal with stuff? Is you just you just fuck them and then yeah, figure it out. Sometimes you just gotta bang it out, you know. I mean, I I feel like she has a generally fuck it attitude towards life anyway. Yes, for mm -hmm. sure. So it, it just you know we're using multiple meanings of the word <laughs> fuck here. You know, it's like yeah. you know some bad guys come up to bother her, fuck them. Some <laughs> guy comes up, <laughs> some guy or girl comes up, she's interested in, fuck them. You know, it's just like, it, you know. <laughs> Turner. Turner. It also, Turner. Also, it also implies one of two things, though, about Taylor and Brian. Either one, bitch is actually much better at reading people than we thought. Or two, probably the more likely scenario, Taylor has been not nearly as subtle as she thinks she's been around Brian. <laughs> Well, she I has mean, no expertise hilarious. in the boy category. We've seen her say. basically stroke out every time she sees him. So, like, <laughs> bitch is probably like, what the hell is hey, wrong pass, with this girl? Hey, can you pass me the wrench? The, the what? <laughs> what, yeah. do you, what do you want? It's like, Jesus, the wrench. God damn. <laughs> <laughs> but our elbows touched that one time. <laughs> that one time. God, teenage girls. I can't. I can't. I can't stand it. Oh, it's the worst. I will say, so Taylor has written so much like an adult. All the characters are. And it's moments like this where I just think, oh my God, that's right. Taylor is a fucking child. Like, she is what? <laughs> 16, 17? Good God. Can... Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. No, I, like this is this is what separates teenagers from adults. Like teenagers have complicated thoughts. They think things out sometimes. 
So but they they don't bat at a higher percent, like a high enough percentage. That's why they're teenagers. Well, like, I would argue adults also suck. Oh, well, once again, <laughs> I didn't say that. We're saying adults in terms <laughs> right, of right, age. Right. I'm not yes, saying their yes. brains are fully developed. You're right, you're right. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. But yeah. that chapter takes a sharp turn. Yeah, it does. Uh, once they realize that Coyle has started another phase of his master plan. Yeah, and jumped the gun, jeez. Yeah, outed everybody. Which, totally, like, not that we wouldn't be, but totally on the undersider's side here. Like, what the yes. hell, Coyle? <laughs> like, what did you think was going to happen? Instead of our what the fuck, Taylor, I have a what the, what the fuck, fuck, Coyle. Coyle. We yeah. have, like, one rule. <laughs> one rule. Yeah. It's you don't go to somebody's house and fuck about. Like... Yeah. Or everybody yeah. comes and they fuck you. Yeah, yep. as someone who has a lot of contingency plans and who has like thought his plans out, Quill did not think this one out. Like he mm-hmm. just didn't. Okay, so yeah, I think he I'm, thought it out. He just calculated. Yeah, he did, yeah, yeah. No, I, I like, think I'll take this risk. No, I, I think, um, I think that this was absolutely part of his plan. Um. I think part of the reason why it feels so badly put together is only because we're seeing it from the undersider's perspective. And of course, mm-hmm. Coyle probably didn't know slash couldn't account for what was going to happen with Bitch and Empire 88 just before this all got let out, right? That's true. But, mm-hmm, but true. I think that that part aside, this is exactly what he wanted. He probably knew the protectorate was going to take Aster. He probably knew that Purity mm-hmm. was going to freak out. I think what he wanted was he wanted to disrupt the public's view of Empire 88 even more. Like in the mm. sense of, because there's still the sense of like, yeah, they're, you know, racist, but maybe they're not that bad, you know, or, um, but just completely to obliterate their image and just reveal, right. hey, these people are monsters. And yeah, yeah. anybody, anybody who's an adjacent ally, not a member of the Empire, but anybody who's like an adjacent ally, might be rethinking their entire relationship with the Empire now. Just going right. like, do I really want to work with these people? And then, oh, mm-hmm. here comes a new guy, Coil. Well, he's calm, cool, collected. Let me work with this guy instead. I, I can't think even that- tell what skin color he is, so you know, I can't be racist <laughs> towards or oh against God. him, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I feel like um I feel like that absolutely was his plan. Like he just wanted to disrupt the city. He wanted to put yeah. them into mer- more turmoil because of course when Society's in upheaval. That's when it's easier for you know the the strong man that's to true. come in and to take control. And he, it, so I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It only exactly. feels bad. It only feels bad because it put the undersiders at risk. Right. He's, and, yeah, he's taking control of the of the situation. He's taking out parts of you know we mentioned you know Alan you said earlier you know, Taylor's you acts as though she's a queen. She needs to be in the center. If we're using that chessboard analogy. He wiped off a bunch of the pieces off the chessboard with that move. And if he took a couple of pawns on his own side out with him, okay, fine. And and like he's even like he even says to the undersiders, he's like, look, I have other teams in place here. Like you haven't agreed to work with me, you know. And sure, I realize that like this could be bad for you, but but I I made a calculated decision and I did it and I it happened he and there it is. Played a queen's gambit. He did. He did. <laughs> and and he proves he's funny. he's still willing to help them too. He's not like Yes. Oh, this screws yes. the undersiders? No, it sucks to be you guys. He's like, yeah, No, like, I'll give you them. men, I'll give you vehicles. We're gonna work right. on this together. We'll fix it together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Yeah, and what are they gonna do in the meantime? Oh no, I guess I'll have to stay at Hot Brian's place. <laughs> Go to the mall. Oh no, I better kiss Hot Brian to (laughs) flex on a bitch. Good lord. Good lord. Okay, wait, we gotta talk. (laughs) Oh, okay. All right, we gotta talk about that. All right, so the bus. Okay, so Brian Taylor, delightful little baby sitting on the bus, you know, whatever. Here comes Sophia, the little fucking bitch. And Taylor decides, sure. Now is the perfect time to flex on Sophia and kiss the ever-loving shit out of Brian without any explanation whatsoever. And Brian just does a little eyebrow wiggle and was like, what's that? And she's like, I'll explain <laughs> later. Like, what? <laughs> Taylor, where I, mean, I don't know what to tell you. Sometimes you got flex on a motherfucker. 
Okay, here's the thing. This was the most like mean girls moment. Yes. It was. Oh my gosh. I felt we have these moments with Taylor where I'm like, who are you? Like, where have you, where's this Taylor been the whole fucking time? Like, this was one of those moments where I'm like, Taylor, who are you? This is not the Taylor that I, you know, I was going to say know and love, but this is not the Taylor I know. Like, the Taylor I know stays quiet and lets juice get poured on her head. Yeah. Yeah. It's, this felt like, the moment the first time Taylor saw an opportunity because she's known forever that she could beat these bullies with her bugs. Easy peasy. Yeah. But that's not what she wants. And it, this felt like the first moment for her where she had the opportunity to beat them at their own game yes. and kind of be that, be the, be the bigger bully, if you will. Yeah. Be <laughs> um, the vicious one. Yeah, exactly. And that she just, jumped on the opportunity. She practically jumped on Brian. But that's okay, Hannah. I mean, if you want her to get bullied, you, yeah, I know you like her getting bullied. <laughs> I know you want her to stay in her lane. Me? Know her place. <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah. No. You know, this is, I realize that this Taylor, you know, no. is too much for you. <laughs> but that's okay, because Sophia's Whoa. about to teach her a lesson. Jeez. Okay, first I get of all. It. You're, you're a Sophia, Stan. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm sure I just blew out my mic. Whoa. Hey, watch yourself, sir. Oh, finally, somebody worse than me being a Kaiser stand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. The bullying teenager is definitely worse than the white supremacist. Yes. Oh, my God. Okay. This All is right. a factual that statement. That is, okay. you know, I've always said every teenager is a little Hitler. You know, I guess this goes to prove. Oh my god! Also, what a classic, classic Kaiser Stan move to be like, uh, yeah, okay, but hey, look at the angry teenager. Okay, how no, about that's, that? That's true. That's, that's way true. worse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> way worse. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay, no, well, but, uh, Sophia doesn't let it go. No, she does not. No, not at all. Golly, Whoa, that came out. Okay. So I'm, did you guys remember that that happened? Because I did not remember that. No, I did. I, I just it. was waiting for it to go down. It was Whoa. one of those, like, I didn't remember it. And then on the bus, I was like, oh, that's right. This happens. And then as, like, I didn't remember anything. And then as I kept reading, I was like, oh, that's right. Oh, this got way worse than I remembered it getting. So, yeah, I couldn't yeah. remember yeah. how she was getting away with it in my head. Because I was like, where the fuck was she? That she could just... Kind of like beat the shit Taylor. out of Taylor for a second. Yeah. I couldn't remember if it was mm-hmm. in like, I assumed it was like, I don't know, like a dressing room or like a, yes. in the bathroom again. Right. Like uh, the it had bathroom. to be somewhere secluded. I couldn't remember for the life of me. And mm-hmm. honestly, like that, oh gosh, the, the visceral feeling, I, again, some of the, some of the, the, the wounds that Wild Bill writes feel painful reading them. And when, when, uh, when she is like, just ripping, practically ripping off Taylor's ear, you mm-hmm. know, twisting it and, and you know, enough so that Taylor needed stitches in her ear. Sophia's just, you know, practically ripping her ear off. Like, it made mm. my scalp tingle. Like, it made my head, yeah. my ear hurt. It's so, ugh, so painful. We've had, we've had other moments with bullies, but all the other moments have been in some way, indirect contact, yes. like throwing mm-hmm. juice, you know, d- d- hiding, taking papers, whatnot. Sophia, though, has been the one to punch her the into the locker. Yeah. Yeah. It's the one yeah. to f- like literally physically assault her. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. We're, see we're, it here. Emma is the uh, kind of emotional abuser mm-hmm. in, in, mm-hmm. The, in the relationship. Yes. Um, Sophia has definitely been like the physical powerhouse behind everything, right. which has been. Which, oh, yeah, it's just, it's brutal to read. It hurts yeah. so hard. But yeah. on the positive end, though, this is the first time that Taylor actually fights back against her bullies. Yes. Yeah. In a physical way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and she's time. like, you know what? I'm going to use these lessons Brian's taught me. Smack her in yes. the face with a big book. You know, they start going at it. Oh. Um, so proud. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. The one yeah. Waiting oh. for that for so long. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I also love Taylor's, uh, her, her book selection as she's going through her head goes from like yeah. all the way to like escapist fantasy to just practical, this is what I need to learn. Like nonfiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. I respect it. And she, she wanted yeah. to get a dog, a uh, book about dogs, right? Yeah. That was uh, one of them. Yeah. 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 That was nice. Yeah. Yep. He's really trying. I love it. Those books, but whatever. What'd you say? <laughs> 
I didn't get those books, but whatever. Well, I, mean, yeah. I wouldn't buy them either after Mr. Bookman just was like, yeah. yeah, you can beat that yeah. bitch in the corner. I don't give a fuck. What the what fuck the is up with hell? him? And he totally like stood up uh, for Sophia. Even though Brian like steps in and tells him off, he's still like, oh yeah, well that girl in the nice tennis skirt said that said something, so I believed her. Like, golly. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it right now. Yeah. Fucking old people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was no. that was shitty. But again, you know, there's, there's two things I hate in this world. It's people who are you know teenagers. Everybody younger than me, <laughs> children, <laughs> stupid. Everybody older than me, incompetent, <laughs> withering. Jesus. <laughs> well, the only good age is my age. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well. Exactly. <laughs> but Brian oh. does step in. Doesn't does. doesn't really mm. help much. No, <laughs> but, not in the slightest. I do love him just telling her to shut up. Oh, yeah. that was that oh. was pretty good because she tries so to weasel her way around yeah. him. Like, yeah. oh, this this girl, yeah. and he's just like, shut up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, so good. Ooh. Comes to Taylor's Taylor's defense and just oh, like a white knight, shining armor. Let's go. Yeah, <sighs> but then Pop turns right, right around and. Yep. destroys her whole life. Oh, yep, yep, she confesses. No. Oh. Nick, it brings me to a moment during our school uh, talent oh, show um, mm-hmm. in which <laughs> you got up on stage <laughs> and did two sentence horror stories. What? Yes. And one of yes. them... It's about getting friends on. Nick, do you, do you know which one I'm talking about? Would you like to recall it for us? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, they weren't quite two sentence, but they were super short horror stories. Little paragraph. I, can't, I, had yeah. a, I had a name for them, but I can't remember. But basically, one of them was oh, so good. Um, it was a a girl and a guy were walking down the street, and uh, you know this romantic street at our college. And the girl looks at the guy, hopeful that he'll say something, and he leans in and just goes, "I really appreciate you as my sister in Christ." <laughs> ooh, ooh. And it just oh, that's the vibe. Just that's the chilling, feeling. Haunting. No. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. you like a sister, sister in Christ. Christ. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Absolutely. I love you. Can you tell me like a sister in Christ? Yeah, that's how we know we went to Bible college. <laughs> oh god. Oh. So something I thought about after the fact. I came back later and wrote a note. Taylor's first kiss is not about romance. It's about the ability to have romance in spite and to spite the haters. It's mostly mm. a negative and a little bit positive. It's tactical. It's it's tactical, but like, sh- sure, she wanted to kiss Brian. Yeah. But the whole, like, the whole, uh, if you remember Forgetting Sarah Marshall, where they've got like the bedrooms next to each other and they're making noise, at one point in time, they realized like, oh, you making noise wasn't for me. It was for him or her or whatever. This wasn't about Brian. This was about Sophia. Like, mm-hmm. yes, this kiss. Right. I dedicate this kiss to Sophia. to Sophia and to Emma and all of them. And Brian happened to be there. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, see, that's a good observation. Uh, it makes me wonder too, like, Brian's rejection is rough here, but I wonder if it happened in a more natural and authentic way, how he would have responded. Mm-hmm. Like, I wonder yeah. if the if the fact that he realized it was a tactical move plays yes. into his sort of like... It has to, right? Yeah. It, it yeah. does. I think I was going to say, I don't think he realizes it, but he 100% realizes, you know, because she you know tells him and he kind of gets it. And I think he is like, ah, that's the fact that you did that maybe is a little off-putting. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think, I mean, I think that like sometimes you you don't necessarily know how you feel. You know, you get form fuzzies around somebody and it, it takes a, a sobering moment like this when the pieces come together and you go, oh, yeah, um, I'm going to have to say I like you as a friend and as a sister and that's how I see you. Because, you know, up until this mo- moment, he could have been flirting with her because he's feeling the vibes, he's feeling the moment. But then to have it come out that way, for for the kiss to have been revealed as tactical, for you know all of this to have happened, and of course you know 
it was ears bleeding all over the place. Like, yeah, I, you know, you've put me on the spot and I have to make like a flash decision. And my flash decision is that you're a friend and that's it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. he backtracks and he backtracks and we see it even later. Uh, uh, Taylor makes a comment about how he seems to uh, distance himself from her a little bit. And she feels that loss in the sense of like, Oh, like I fucked it up. And, you know, I ruined whatever it was that was going on, regardless of whether it was romantic or not. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's him, you know, backpedaling. Right, right. But Mm -hmm. he doesn't get to backpedal too far. Nope. Because purity goes psycho. Moonbeam! (laughs) Yep. Good Lord. Absolutely. Absolutely delightful. Yeah. She scares me. (laughs) <laughs> oh man, nothing yeah, like I, a, that was a, a thing. woman I, scorned or a mother having her child taken away from her to absolutely. I didn't even realize how much of an artillery piece. God damn. Yeah, exa- yeah, she was until this read. Mm-hmm. Like she right. is essentially, you know, the laser beam in every anime that's just mm-hmm. leveling streets. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like oh, just- sorry. Uh, real quick, uh, should I do the summaries for the next couple of chapters? Because that was where I had stopped. Oh, oh yeah. that's true. Yeah, yeah, that, that's when we uh, stopped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Go so, so we're we're heading into chapter seven now. So purity is, I said, quote unquote, moonbeams the city. That's a D and D reference. Uh, the undersiders head to meet up, um, and uh, 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 Brian and Taylor and um, some delightful paramedics that Coyle has provided uh, run into a fight with Hook Wolf, which I I put in his powers because it's so I couldn't remember all of them. Hook Wolf, the shifting mass of hooks, blades, and other weapons. Storm Tiger, Arrow Kinetic, and Cricket, Subsonic Noises and Radar. At chapter 8, they fight. We get the first responders to safety. Um, uh, Gru and Skitter flee to find the others. Uh, chapter 9, Purity is kind of being handled by New Wave. New Wave has showed up and is trying to take care of Purity. Uh, as on the ground with the doggos, we group together with the Undersiders and fight Night, the unseen monster is what I'm calling her, and Fog, which I have called Foggy Misty Mist, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Crusader, and Crusader with the ghostly duplicates. Uh, and then in uh, Chapter 10, we have a little bit more fighting until... Uh, uh, Purity kind of takes it down to the ground and Tattletail reveals to her where Aster's location is her daughter and agrees to leave with her to prove that she's telling the truth. And Tattletail and Purity fly away to 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 save Aster. Yeah. Um, there's a I think there's we'll one other there. here, uh one other villain that I want to throw out there, I think may have been missed was Rune is on mm, yep. uh yes, is with yes, um, right. oh, Empire yeah. Radiator. Yes, add Rune to that. As yeah. Well. Um yeah, just we got a whole host of and, new powers. Yeah, yeah runes I know. Is, I got I to gotta keep track of all the powers here. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah, Runes is moving things up to a ton. Is that right? And she has to yes. touch them first. She yes. has telekinetic yep. powers, but she has to touch she it first. To touch but it she first. can move anything. She, it seems time. like she can move multiple objects, each yes. weighing up to a ton. So, yes. Is it each weighing up to a ton? Because yeah, at one point, she's moving multiple massive objects that Taylor notices. Okay. So... Yeah, much, very. So I think I think what's interesting to me here is, um, you know, the undersiders have fought some pretty formidable foes. Um, you know, Lung and Oni Lee being in Bakuda probably being the top three, right? But mm-hmm. what was interesting about those cases is that, except for the fight with Oni Lee and Lung, and even then with Oni Lee and Lung, these fights were pretty much handled one on one. Or in the case of Lung, it was like five v one with Lung holding his own. We yeah. get a kind of a flip script here with these characters because, uh, oh my gosh, these villains are terrifyingly powerful. Yes. Um, I mean, Alan, mm-hmm. you mentioned uh, Purity being just this artillery weapon, but my God, we've got Crusader with these you know, massive amounts of duplicates. Rune is moving city blocks. Fog yeah. and Night are ridiculous. Hook Wolf and Storm Tiger and Cricket, like the whole... This whole group of Empire 88 and Coil's not even there. Or not Coil. Uh, Kaiser's not even there. Nope. This metal bending guy. Neither are uh, Finya and Minya from what we can see. Like you just add in this whole group together and 
I mean, you've got the power of the army of a small country, if not more, yep. in like 10 people. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The power levels are, in this, are insane. Yeah, yeah. This is the first time I really feel like the power level has jumped from, yeah, lung is pretty dangerous to, holy shit, <laughs> levels. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's the fight with Hook, Wolf, Storm, Tiger, and Cricket that I really kind of felt that sense of, oh, we are not doing well. Brian is not doing well, and neither yeah. is Taylor. And, and it's just the two of them against these three. And it is, we are not doing well. This is not a fight and win. This is a run and get away. This is not a fight we're going to win. You need to regroup with the other people. Yeah. And just the the funny secondary powers too, like Storm Tiger having enhanced senses of smell. Um oh, Cricket yeah. having her Cricket having her acrobatics that she can do. Right. Um there's all these like little secondary powers too that mm -hmm. seem to play into these characters as well. I loved getting the opportunity aside from the wards, which I think is the only other team that we've seen at this point with the undersiders, of course. Um, and they were and they were dealt with pretty easily. But this is the first time we've really seen another team work together, like powers working in coordination with each other and teammates working in coordination with each other. And like seeing how scary it would be to fight any type of organized group that that knew what they were doing. Right. Like the undersiders are great and they kind of work together, but their powers are all pretty defensive. So it's yeah. it's a lot of like retreat and escape and 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 tactics in that way. Um, but like seeing Night and Fog <laughs> work together and Cricket running in there and being unaffected because of her her abilities and and just seeing all of that kind of blend together uh, was like really, really scary. It was like, my goodness, how are these guys not ruling everything. Well, I guess they kind of are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they are one of the right? top people. They're one of the top yeah. people. Hook in Wolf, group, yeah. in terms of like him charging and his body and whatnot, makes me think a lot of the, is it the Brutes from Mass Effect 3? You know what I'm talking oh, about, Jacob? Yeah, yeah. The like, it, the big old chargey boys. <laughs> I have boys. no idea yeah. what you're talking about. It like does kind of have the that metal imagery and yeah. like, yeah. Also, Hook Wolf, when his arm, you know, is cut off at like the elbow and it folds out like a Swiss Army knife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, oh. Yeah. it's pretty dope. Lord have yeah. more wild. There is some. There's there's a big some big old in the. Uh, stay tuned for part two where we uh, design our. Warning graphic content label for every episode. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> that one's just a Swiss. One. Speaking of brutal, when they finally get to, to dealing with Cricket, they deal with it by Skitter getting a knife in Cricket's legs and then oh, dragging it yeah. through oh, her oh, leg. Yes. Oh, yeah, like, I heard again. Oh, Holy like cow. Just, oh, Taylor. <laughs> yeah, talk about brutal injuries. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. But also, Wolf. like again, it feels so realistic. Like mm -hmm. that's that's just the response you would expect in that situation, right? Like, what else is she gonna do? And yeah. you're fighting for your life there. Like you do whatever you can. Oh, it's, yeah, so well written. Just, just absolutely <laughs> brutal. I'm rubbing my leg right now. It hurts. Yeah, golly, <laughs> gosh, my muscles all clench up anytime we're like talking about some some big uh, skin mm -hmm. the big stuff. injury. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. yeah. <sighs> but also again we get another we get another bit of Taylor again very defensive here having a kind of run but but we do get a bit more of her really good sort of <laughs> the the gamer in me is calling it game sense but like the like the the tactician mindset that she has where she's she's really starting to develop these uh, they're not really powers cuz it's not really tied to her powers but these sort of like her ability to read the battlefield and understand what needs to be done is starting to really develop here. Um, knowing where to flee, what to run. She figures out Cricket's powers pretty quickly. Uh, like just sort of being able to understand everything and, and get a good response in place is, is fun to see develop. And then they flee. Yep. Uh, so then they go fight the, not the other Nazis. Yeah. Uh, gr two things I learned here. Number one, Gru... Does not like being taken care of. Mm. 
Yeah. No. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Y- you know, for all this cool exterior when he's like trying to take care of others, as soon as somebody else has to take care of him, no, he, he becomes like a little bitch about it. Yeah. Yeah. Classic man, am I right? Oh, you're so right. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the that other thing true. I learned is they show up, Taylor rolls out, and she's like, man, I'm never going to be one of those, you know, witty banter type heroes. I don't know, Taylor. I thought Sabrina the Teenage Nazi was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like someone's first attempted banter, but it kind of landed. It totally landed. <laughs> it landed. I, it I think it was great. I wish she'd said it out loud. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I do oh, love that. Great. Again, uh, I'm sure if uh, our our Taylor was here, uh, he probably would have mentioned it. But the whole thing of like, oh, so I see we have Sabrina the Teenage Witch on this planet. Like, all right, okay, cool. I mean, that yeah. would have yeah. that would have no, come absolutely. out at the same time that like we knew the powers would have existed. So yeah, sure. Like she probably wouldn't have been the witch, but yeah. In this universe, Sabrina the Teenage Witch is really just it's a documentary. Um, well, (laughs) yeah. Um, but no, I, I do think I can, I like to imagine, try to imagine a person's writing process. Right. So I like to imagine that wild Bo wrote that line seriously. Like she's like thinking, oh yeah, this is a good dig. And then he's like, wait, no, that's not clever, (laughs) but I can use it because it's not clever. (laughs) You just imagine how the author's thinking through like, oh, this is funny. funny. Yeah. Is it funny? It's not funny. I think it could be I don't know. I could leave it in, but but I gotta I won't I could leave it in, but I'm say it. I'm gonna gonna hedge I'm gonna hedge my bets. Right. I'm gonna gonna hedge my bets (laughs) by saying that it's not funny and then people will be like, oh it actually was funny and then I'll feel good. Wild Bow, it was amazing. We loved it. We thought it was fantastic. (laughs) You did a great job. Stellar. Stellar. It's I feel like he writes a lot of uh, Taylor's dialogue like that. Uh, yeah, again, not to dig at the actual the writing style because I think it's fantastic for the character, but it it feels like a lot of Taylor is written because she's very indecisive herself about things. So it it does work really well into her character to be like, yeah. uh, that was a dumb thing I just said. Hopefully nobody heard me." <laughs> <laughs> it's a little peek into that like teenage angst, the teenage yeah, you know, anxiety. Exactly. Yeah. I also love that despite all the powers, all the planning, all the, uh, you know, all the cool stuff that's going on. Ultimately, this fight is kind of settled by Tattletail just having a gun. Oh, As golly. It always is. <laughs> you know? Bless her. Tattletail Sometimes it's just about putting a bullet in someone. Yeah. Absolutely. So far, wait, how many fights have we had so far with the Undersiders? And how many have been oh, solved gosh. with Tattletail with a gun? Is this two? Uh, I would argue <laughs> three out of the three, uh, maybe the four fights we've had, 50% four. of them have been solved with the gun. <laughs> with the gun. Yeah. With uh, Lisa funny. just shooting someone. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. again, Sometimes. you know, tying us back to our, our time you earlier. With start blasting, the, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for real. Well, you know, with Empire 88 outside of Bitch's Dog Shelter, like sometimes mm-hmm. a gun is the better weapon. Yep. I think a, a gat is what the kids are calling it nowadays. <laughs> no, I don't. Well, no. Alan, I don't think that means what you think it means. If I, if I trust anybody, <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't say a gat. Okay. I said a gat. Oh, a gat. Okay. 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 Well, if, if, if there's <laughs> anybody in this group who yeah, might Nick, know, I know the child mind when, lingo, you dirty, dirty boy. it's Nick. Yeah. Nick knows he's with the hip youngsters. He would know uh, the correct terminology. A default. Uh, out of context, that makes, that makes Nick sound. Really bad out of context. <laughs> oh, I'm no, sorry. No, no. It made the we Kaiser talk- stand sound bad out of context. <laughs> oh, <laughs> heaven forbid. None of this is none of this is making it. No, 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 no. Michael, That's Michael, don't so you funny. dare. I will nope. bring it up. I, I will bring it up a second time. You guys sound <laughs> horrible. You guys sound so old. <laughs> oh, oh, that is so funny. Funny. I'm dying. <laughs> Can't it, um, it back. Do, are we okay moving off from this, or do yeah, we want to talk yeah. about how creepy yeah. Night and Fog are? I was gonna are. say we really need to talk about how creepy yeah. Night and Fog yeah. are, specifically oh, Night. But like, was well, because Night is really sticks out to me. But oh man, yeah, no, those little that little duo from where Germany. Did you, did you enjoy the Fog versus Gru cloud off? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I did enjoy boy, the cloud misty off. mist. Ooh, I was here for it. <laughs> it gave me, I know, you know, very different uh, uh, materials, but it definitely gave me hardened vibes. You know, the great Metapod battle of Pokemon. What? 
<laughs> two of them just two metaphors just more named smoke. back and forth. Yeah, we'll all out smoke you, <laughs> you <laughs> smoke. <laughs> the problem is that um, Knights is a little bit more effective. I think Knights is mm-hmm. not Knights. Sorry, Fogs. Fogs is a little bit more yeah. effective. Oh, yeah. Then Gru, yeah. Oh, then Gru, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like an acidy kind of mist, ain't it? Yeah, it's. Yeah. It, it reminded me of that so uh, of the one Hunger Games like obstacle in the I think yes, the second movie or whatever it was. Yeah, it's in the yeah, third yeah. one. It's in, really? the one one. it's in the clock one. It's in the clock one. Oh yes, that is the second one. Movie or book, you can tell which yeah. ones I watched or read. Um, <laughs> well, I don't. I was gonna say I don't know. I don't. It didn't feel like it was acid. It's not I mean, acid. It's similar it's to that. Corrosive though, isn't it? Is it I corrosive? Will, I will look maybe this it is. I th- I like felt that, like yeah. it was, and maybe maybe it is corrosive in some sense. But I felt like it was because the fog is his body, like him willing harm, like mm-hmm. as you breathe him in or like in contact with him. You know, like I, man, I don't even know how to describe it. It it is a very strange power, and we see later that. Um, one of the dogs, Angelica, breathed in some of the yes. power. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Log. And it it seems to have these long lasting effects that really are a detriment to what mm. um to just see your physical health. Like it's interesting that you can breathe in this person, fog, and it doesn't hurt him, but it does hurt you permanently. Um, at least or at least long term. We don't know if it's permanent or yeah. not, but it seems long term. Um, and uh, bitch's power can't heal it. You know she's tried. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, right. that to me is just such an interesting aspect of this. Um, of this power that makes it so unique. And yeah, it's just like corrosive. It's almost like um, you know what it is. I think it's more like a nerve gas, if I could put it that way. Yeah, it's like a nerve gas kind of. It's not really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like the wiki gas. describes it here. Right. Yeah, as I literally an, have it pulled er- up. <laughs> as it, ero- it erodes living matter. Right. Is mm. the way it's so it is corrosive, here. but not necessarily yeah. acidic in that yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. But, well, and then you combine that with Knight's power, which um, I find to be one of the most interesting in the section. Same. I Just agree. Just so I fascinating. Love the description because. Lisa goes into detail about, you know, just trying to describe what is going on with her power. And then Taylor asks, is that the power? And she goes, no, but it's the best we can do. Yeah. And that makes it so much worse. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. Oh, and, you know, we, we have this joke. Um, I know that we've talked about this before amongst ourselves about this idea of uh, useless superpowers or bad superpowers. In one yeah. of the joke ones we've come up with, I know you and I, Jacob, have talked about this before, is the uh, you can turn invisible, but only only when nobody's looking at you. Mm. Um, but this is kind of a funny twist on that, where it's like, no, yeah, this is a, she's a monster, but only when you can't see her. But that's what makes it so scary. Yeah, it's is, the Weeping Angels from Doctor Who. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, yeah. That's all yeah. I was thinking it's of. Half, half, of time. half of the creepy Don't pastas look away. from the internet. Yeah, right. yeah, don't look away, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh it's but, terrifying. But I love to, I love to how, because she's not just a random monster and she's sentient, um, I love how smart she is with her power. Like, she carries mm. flashbang grenades with her. Genius. Mm, she has a cloak right. that she can detach and throw on you, and it has hooks so you can't easily take it off. Like, just yeah. thinking through her costume and her setup that she has yeah. and on top of all of that if she gets hurt she turns into the monster she gets healed mm-hmm. cool. I, this is mm-hmm. like I like what is this is ridiculous i love <laughs> it though i mean if you can't tell this is my favorite superpower from this arc which we'll get to later <laughs> but um just That's such a great such a cool and, and i think part of what makes it so cool is not just the power itself but like i said her implementation of it right yeah. so very cool power love it she also doesn't have a static form while she's doing it. Like she was constantly like changing limb mm-hmm. structure right. and how many. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. Taylor says at one point that when she has her bugs on her, she counts too many joints, like too many elbows, basically. 
and it's like, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> no. Speaking of, speaking of no. comparisons, um, have any of you guys read read the Maze Runner series or seen the movie? I've seen not the movie. all of it, yeah, but uh, been a hot minute. it's not great. Yeah. I'm going to be honest. I'm sorry if any of our fans are Maze Runner fans too, but it, please be honest. Is, is it really that good? But um, <laughs> there are these monsters. There's these labyrinth monsters in the first one that are described as. They're basically, if you combined like a slime creature, but with hook wolf kind of, mm. um, and that's kind of how I see like her thing is just this monstrous being all like teeth and claws and spikes and metal and just something completely inhuman, but you never see it. And that's just, oh, mm. ugh, it's just so interesting and so creepy. I love it. Yeah. Like with horror <laughs> movies, it's not so much what you see, it's what you can't see. Like, it's what's just yeah. around the corner. It's what's hidden in the dark under the bed. It's once you've seen the monster, like, sure, yeah, that's terrifying. But it's not, it's nowhere near as terrifying as when you can't see it. And she mm-hmm. personifies that so well. Oof. And and I was just thinking about this. With night and fog, they are the perfect combination. Fog turns into fog and, you know, obscures vision from night. And night can do what night does best. Like they are the perfect combination mm-hmm. to work together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I feel like we'll we'll see this, uh, you know, again too. And and I love I love the team up of powers because it's fun to think about. Again, this is just part of the world building that I think that Wildbow does so well. Is it's it's fun to think about like. Yeah, if, if you have a world where you have all these different types of powers, you're going to gravitate towards people that you synergize with. Yeah, like it just makes sense that you're going to team up with with, you know, people whose powers work well with yours. And it's kind of fun to see that play out. But then Tattletail shows up with a gun. Yep. Saves the day. Saves mm-hmm. the day as always. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting that in the end, after all of this damage that Purity has done, she really just wants her daughter. And like from, mm-hmm. the, from the very first time we meet Purity in her interlude, she's, she's a mom. Like that is her most important thing is that she's a mom. Mm-hmm. And, and her her choosing to even get in costume is to protect her daughter and to do what, you know, even though she's wrong, uh, to, to do what she thinks is right for the city, even though it's mm-hmm. absolutely racist. Um, but like her, her priority is to be a mother and to make sure that Esther is safe. safe. And the second that tail, uh, that, that I almost said Taylor, the second that Tattletail offers to help her get Aster back, that of course that'll solve it immediately. You know, Purity's done. You can give me my daughter. Let's go right now. Like I'm, I'm done. All I want is my daughter, and mm-hmm. it just kind yeah. of ends the fight with it. It's a little anticlimactic, but like it is. But it that feels is what? Yeah, it feels honest to to Purity's motivation. Yeah, and, and I think again we kind of mentioned this before too, but like Kaiser isn't here because no. presumably he's got other things he'd rather care about. Given this shakeup, like he right. has, he has some kind of em- empire, yeah. <laughs> as the name implies, that's crumbling all around him. He's not; he doesn't really give a shit about Aster. Uh, yeah. So this is this is Purity's battle, which kind of you know, Night and Fog and the rest of the group there are probably pretty loyal to Purity. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you sort of get those dynamics. But yeah, I, again, it, it does feel a little anticlimactic, but it it completely fits with the, the resolution fits the the catalyst for the whole fight. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, fight is over. I was about to say that leads us into uh, the last couple chapters here. Ooh. So, uh, chapter eleven. Uh, a couple days later, the Undersiders, uh, with a return to Tattletail, meet up in Coil's base, where we meet. Where he, you know, he actually does apologize for kind of throwing them under the bus, and we meet a little girl named Dinah. And we see kind of what her power can do. And we see the hold that Coil has over her. Uh, and then in chapter 12, Taylor argues with the rest of the Undersiders about Dinah and about kind of what they've gotten themselves into and, you know, who knew and who didn't and, and basically how much they're willing to forgive in the sense with Coil. And uh, she prepares to leave. She gets ready to go. She's packing her bag. And then an alarm goes off, announcing that an Endbringer is coming to Brockton Bay. Dun, dun, dun. 
Ah! Yeah. What a All right, so let's back up. Yeah, I know. Great cliffhanger. So Coil has the most secret ass, secret ass layer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they went through yeah. so many. Like this felt. I didn't remember it being this difficult to get into his base. <laughs> <laughs> it was very Adam West Batman, just like yeah, just like going yeah. through we cave wall, and, waterfall, road yeah. signs, <laughs> like just, <laughs> yeah, like. I assume he's literally making them go through like the back door. Like there's another one that just goes straight onto the street, but he's making them come the through the back because yeah. he's just like, ah, I don't know if I can trust I put y'all so yet. so much time and effort into this and nobody gets to see it. <laughs> but I, yeah. Just, Undersiders, pay me yeah. a visit. <laughs> yeah. Why are you not amused? Cool. I specifically asked for it. I specifically yeah. <laughs> asked for you to be amused. But then we're, we meet, uh, we meet Dinah. We meet part of, yeah. Coil's master plan. Oh, uh, thank you for saying it like that because that was going to be my question, Michael. Dina or Dinah? I was saying both, and I don't know what it is. I believe I'm going to. I'm going to guess it's Dinah, but I'm going to guess Dinah. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've okay. um, it. If it's Dina, I'm going to declare another mistrial. I think. <laughs> um, I feel like Dinah, as in like dinosaur. What? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? I'm sorry. Okay, you lost me. I was on board. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's how I read it in my head that it's it's like Dina I mean, as a dinosaur. Are we back to a you know Bakuda situation? <laughs> like <laughs> Bakuda. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I just <laughs> like dinosaur. I know that's not how you spell yeah, dinosaur. Yeah. It's with an O, but see I'm thinking I of just, the the sorry. Dina won't you blow? Dina won't you blow? I beg your pardon. Oh, that's right. The class. Oh, that's classic. Yeah. Your horn. Your horn. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just always go to all the DC characters that are named Dinah. Are there? Right. Yeah. Go like on. Black Canary is Dinah. Oh. Either way, we'll get to the bottom of how to pronounce this name I'm as we sure always it's do. Dinah. Guys, we're, we're stumbling over literally one Dinah. of the easiest names in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and it won't be the last time. <laughs> Just wait till we get to my favorite name, which is coming next dark. So don't worry. I say very soon. I will, I will correct soon. you all. We cannot get ahead of ourselves. I was about to say, I think I know which dark. one it is because it's maybe one of the favorite heroes. Hang it on is. to that. Hang on to it. Hang don't don't. Pin in it. Oh, I'm 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 very large shaking pin. in my seat right now. <laughs> to get back on track. Right. We meet Dinah. Who, Coil's part of Coil's master plan, right? Who can basically run calculations for success rates and give percentages, but yeah. and then immediately tells him the just worst ones. Yeah, well, that was that was funny. That was I interesting. Was though. That part. I mean, it's yeah. it's 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 literally. I mean, well, we know what's happening because we've read the chapter that comes after it. But like, her numbers are going down because time is passing. And things are changing. Yeah. And it's not just, you know, oh, yeah, you know, it's the, it's the thought with time travel of like, oh, yeah, well, you can't time travel without changing time. And the same idea of like, well, there's an infinite amount of possibilities. And so, like, if we're looking at the percentages of survival for, you know, mm-hmm. this, okay, sure. Okay, let's talk about these, you know, scenarios and these scenarios. And it's like, well, regardless of what your scenarios are, they're changing minute by minute because of outside yeah. circumstances that you may not be aware of. And in which case, I honestly wonder if that was, you know, they don't know because they're down in the sewer, but if that was the moment that the Endbringer... I was, oh, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. Decided, you know what? Brockton Bay is nice this time of year. Yep. I think, I think you're spot on. That's exactly how I was reading it. Yeah. Granted, yeah. reading it with, a, with some yeah, with the knowledge. foresight. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but... um. But no, I think that's I think that's exactly what it is, which is so cool, uh, <laughs> so cool reading it again a second time. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, thank you, Michael. From uh, Michael, Dinah. Okay, Dinah. All right. Well, yeah. we should have gone with our gut initially. Good to know. <laughs> like <laughs> dinosaur. Gut, like, here on. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I know, I know, I'm the English <laughs> teacher here, but this isn't a hard one, guys. <laughs> 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 to be fair, I think that was all on me. I I started that. I apologize. <laughs> uh, one thing about this interaction, though, that I totally forgot until rereading it here was that uh, Dinah was the reason for yeah, the, the bank, bank heist. heist. Yes, mm-hmm. I had completely forgotten that, oh. which was like a, just blew my mind. <laughs> right. it again. I mean, it's it's buried in there. It is yeah. buried. Yeah. 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 
And, and, and the fact that Tattletail knew that she knew that the bank heist Ugh. was to distract, but she thought mm-hmm. that Dinah being taken had to do with like a political move and, you know, ransom, not that mm-hmm. Dinah had powers and that Coyle wanted to use those powers, which, yeah. how old is Dinah? Well, Dinah's 12. She is. 12, I think they say. Well, yeah. she is young. She is what, the mayor's daughter? Yeah, yes. mayor's niece or something. something what? Like that. Yeah. What in the heck was her trigger? Yeah. You know, I don't know. like what? What caused that? And I, yeah, I oh, yeah, good it, question. It gets into some really like squelchy, like oily, mucky territory mm-hmm. for me there. And I think that Taylor is feeling it as kind of her, the you know they're all realizing what the fuck is going on. But Tattletail is realizing what the fuck is going on. And Taylor is realizing that she knew this whole fucking time. Mm-hmm. She knew. Yeah. She didn't have all the details, but she knew and and just mm-hmm. went with it anyways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, like, are, am I just the, the weird one or was this implied that it's not like the candy that she gets isn't candy? It's not Yeah, candy. no, they, right. they say okay. that outright. Oh, they just say that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Alec is the one. Alec, Alec is the one who has to ask about it. He's like, "What are you guys talking about? Okay, Why that's does right, she that's want right. her candy?" Yeah. 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 Okay, know? that's right. And Taylor is like, "No, you fucking idiot. She wanted. She wanted drugs, and Coyle's giving her drugs." Yeah. Yeah. Which is just uh, I, the whole thing. Like again, it, it's hard to read your favorite characters like having arguments and things like that because it's not yeah. fun. No. But like, my goodness, you got to side. I th- I think you've got to like Taylor's reasonings for not being comfortable with the group makes right. so much sense. It really like is. how do you? Because yeah. again, it, it it's hard for her too because up this whole time up to this point she's like wrestling with well I'm gonna do the right thing I'm gonna turn them in I'm gonna catch their boss but then she's slowly very obviously really falling for them as friends and and having a good time and hanging out and doing a little crime here and there. That's not too bad. <laughs> but then she gets just hit with child abuse and, and uh, oh, yeah. it's just awful. Like just completely snaps her back to the reality of like, Oh, wait a minute. These are I wanted to be the good guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. These are villains. And I, I find it interesting the way that they all justify it kind of in their own unique ways. They do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, we we kind of expect that maybe from the more cold-hearted ones like Alec, who's like, well, this is not much different than what I grew up with, and right. Bitch, mm-hmm. who's kind of like, doesn't really seem to feel that much for people, only feels for animals. But yeah, with like, you can really see the conflict with Tattletail and Brian, but they're both, you can tell that they're weighing it, right? Like it's this, oh man, I, mm-hmm. I'm not comfortable with this, but I have so much invested in this guy. And I'm depending mm-hmm. on, especially Brian, I'm depending on so much for this guy. Am I just going to throw that mm-hmm. all away for this one thing? Right. You know, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's such a, such a gross thing and really puts the undersiders in such a terrible position. But what I think is interesting too is um, Coyle is proud of this. Yeah. Like he, he presents oh, her yeah. as this is my secret weapon. My secret and weapon, he, my prize. Yeah. My yeah. prize possession. <sighs> like He's Ugh. proud of the fact that he has her and is able to use her. Yeah. Um, and he, he calls her pet, which is just the Ugh, creepiest so thing. Creepy. So right. creepy. It's so creepy. <laughs> so wrong. Yeah. God. Yeah, there's some, there's some bad... Bad, bad juju, bad vibes going on Very here. Bad juju. <laughs> I gotta say, I, I, yeah. Thank, thanks to Wildbo for for putting this part of the story here now, because yeah. we are definitely on that train of like, oh, oh yeah. Coil's a bad guy, but he's gonna fix the city. He's kind of cool. He's got a secret lair. Like he was, he's he's not the white supremacist leader. You know, right. he's not the crazy gang le- leader. You know, he's just he's just like the common collected. Uh, you know, Lex Luthor, you know, that mm-hmm. type of, you love to hate him type of thing. Yeah. But then just hits us with the absolute fucked up reality that, that he is. Right. Which uh, was I mean, good. This is also the first time we see him not completely calm and collected. Right. True. Uh, yeah. True. You know, exactly. And, you know, kind of the reason between his powers of fate or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we all know what it is, but 
uh, at this point, you know, destiny manipulation and calculating percentages of, you know, things going to happen. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's a pretty good combo for doing whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for him to get frustrated, like realize like, Oh, like why, why are the numbers fluctuating? What, what the heck is going on here? Like that assuredness that he had is kind of tied into how those two powers interact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Not to dwell on bad things, but yeah, (laughs) it ends with a bad cliffhanger. It it ends with a bad cliffhanger, (laughs) but it also ends with a decision here with chapter 12. Yeah. Where, you know, Lisa says to her, she says, we had all talked about this as the undersiders. We had all talked about what we were going to do, you know, with, with, if an end bringer came and we we all decided that we would go and Taylor doesn't even have to think about it. She knows what she's going to do and she's, she's going to go. Yeah. You get the sense. And obviously I think we're going to dive into this a lot into the next, in the next episode, but you definitely get the sense that like every Cape has had this internal uh, decision probably already made one way or the other like Mm. this is this is this is something that you you hope you never have to answer but you have your answer ready in a weird way it's very much like the question like what would you do if you won a million dollars like we all kind of know because we've all kind of talked about it before and and yeah exactly that idea of like sure it it might not happen but like we know what we're gonna do and in that same way if an end bringer you know is coming to brockton bay i know what i'm gonna do yeah it's uh-huh. interesting that we just had, you know, everybody make this moral decision to essentially leave a girl in captivity right. yeah. and kind of be okay with it. But whatever the end bringer situation is, is an over of such overriding moral value that they have all agreed to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Oh boy. Which is- which is quite the tease. Which is And that's quite probably the tease. all we should say on that. Yeah, we won't say anything else. Without getting just, into future. Maybe a good time to, to talk lastly about the interlude, which uh, is uh, Miss Militia, or as we know her as Hannah or Hannah, uh, mm-hmm. as she has changed her name, her origin story um, and how she triggered and kind of giving a little bit of uh, insight into her power specifically with her weaponry kind of shifting to whatever she needs it to be. And this conversation with Hannah and Colin, our arms master as we know him, and Dragon, uh, discussing, you know, just kind of a casual discussion of transfers and potential team leans and and uh and then all of a sudden Dragon and Arms Master realizing that the system that they've created to warn them of any you know incoming end bringers is is lighting up and they realize that it's time and colin or arms master pulls the alarm yeah great interlude i I just say real quick as a complete aside colin is the perfect name for the huge nerd that arms master is (laughs) yeah is that not just the perfect name you're like true if you could have guessed what his name was you may not have guessed it but then you hear colin and it's like you're like yeah yeah that's right (laughs) <laughs> That's right. It's sad because the only reference I have for the name Colin is um, Love Actually. And uh, <laughs> the, the, the nerdy British redhead who goes to America. Oh, like that's, yes. oh, that's Colin. <laughs> is that really? But that's it, funny. It, it that's just funny. works so well. So I was like, yeah, yeah that's yeah. my, that's what he looks like in my mind. <laughs> Gotta find that actor's name. I like yeah. Colin because it's not as outright like nerdy you know, as like Tim or something, you know, just a, you know, a name like Alan, somebody that works in IT. <laughs> yeah. but, Alan, you don't work in IT. Uh, but all the other Alans I know do. Uh, yeah, That's but fair. It's a fair assessment. Like it's not, it's not an outright nerdy name, but it's just, it's tainted a little bit with like the nerdiness, the like mm-hmm. dorkiness. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> and, and and which is perfectly this guy. Like, yeah, he's not a complete dweeb. Like, obviously, <laughs> he's kicking people's asses, like hand to hand combat style. He's not like fucking kid win over there, like trying to whip out <laughs> giant laser guns and not like everything up. 
Not like Uber. Oh, yeah, right, no, right, no, no, no. Right. Uber and Leet are like, I'm trying to think of some dumbass name for them in real life. Reginald. God, I can't even. <laughs> I was going to say Arnold. It's funny. We both, we Arnold. both ended up. Arnold. That's, that's right there. One of them's definitely an Arnold. Oh, my God. oh God. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. great. Okay, so we do get a bit of. Um, a bit of important information from Miss Militia's backstory, which yes, crazy backstory. Mm. Just we don't yes. know that much about what happens with her, but right, um, I you can imagine any number of armed conflicts that occurred in that time period that mm-hmm. would have fit. Um, well, she yeah. specifically mentions Turkey. Yeah, Turkey. Yeah. Oh, is that what it? Yeah. So, um, I just thought that her origin story was super interesting to me, where you have this. So, okay, we've talked about this before, about how powers sometimes, not always, but sometimes seem to have a connection to what the person needs when they have their trigger event. Mm. So, like with Taylor, with her, it had to do more with proximity, maybe. There were bugs in the locker with her when she triggered. With Rachel, we see that she was near a dog, she'd been close to a dog, and that was part of what she got her powers with when it triggered. With Miss Militia, whose powers are some of the strangest, basically has the ability to summon any weapon that she needs. Yeah. To the point where she can specify, it seems like she, you know, she she did this in the fight with the Undersiders, where she went from, you know, a machete to a stick or something, I think, um, with her power. Yeah. But she basically has this amorphous blob of energy that she can turn into any weapon, which is such an interesting power. But that is what she needed, or maybe in her mind as a kid, thought she needed in order to get out of the situation she was in. Um, which, yeah. again, just I mean, very well written, very well written, horrific situation for a kid to be in. So, but the thing that's interesting about her, too, that I wanted to note is that she remembers something that it doesn't seem like a lot of people remember that when she got her powers, she felt this connection to this vast otherworldly being. And that's all we know at this point. And obviously Mm -hmm. we've all read it, so we're not going to try to spoil much here, but I, not even that she remembers it. She just like, she's dreaming. Yeah. She dreams it. Yeah. 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 But she says that she, she 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 feels like it's a reality. Like she, not just that she dreams it, but that it is a reality for her. Well, like in her dream, she even talks about forgetting about it immediately. Yeah. Well, yeah. see, like it fades as she it fades as time passes, and then she dreams mm-hmm. and she remembers again, and then it slowly fades again because she's you know she's dreamed it. She's waking up. She mentions it to Dragon. If she was forgetting instantly, she wouldn't have mentioned it to Dragon. But she she mentions it because it's still in her mind just after dreaming. So it stays. And then it fades, as opposed to what she alludes to, which is her experience, is that people don't seem to remember that or Mm -hmm. have even had that experience. Yeah. Yeah. Seems unique to her at this point, which is interesting. Yeah. It's just such a such a unique experience that I thought it was worth pointing out. Yeah, um, Yeah. that we we haven't really had that yet or before. It's an important thing to note here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean, it just builds into uh, there is sort of this unanswered question that hasn't been mentioned at all in the story, but is very present, which is that before Scion's appearance in 1984, there was nothing. There was no powers. This is a very, very yeah. recent thing. And so yeah. there was this explosion of powers. So there is a clear before and after, mm-hmm. you know, why? <laughs> so yeah. it's not important to the story right now, but it is sort of just kind of in the back of your mind and the sort of, kind of yeah. plays into that. Can you kind of, as you're reading it, just sort of put it there. You know, you sort of, cat, you know, categorize all your questions about the story and it's just sort of back there <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll grab it later. Yeah. 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 For sure. So, um, just because uh, this was brought up a while back, um, in the Bank Heist episode, I mentioned to you, to everybody, I said, those of you who know will know I can't believe I forgot that they name dropped certain people so early. One of those names was the Endbringers. And Taylor, Mm -hmm. when Taylor says it twice, Lisa has a very interesting reaction. Um, I wish I had it pulled up in front of me, but basically she's like, she has this reaction that's kind of like, why the hell are you bringing them up twice Mm -hmm. in the same conversation? 
there's a lot right. in that statement. And now we see that there's a whole alarm system just for these beings, uh, just for these things, heroes, creatures, whatever they are, we don't know yet. There's an alarm system set in place for them. That's how dangerous yep. they are. Yeah. And oh my gosh, it's just, you can feel the floor kind of drop out from under you mood wise at the end. Yes. Here. It's, it's great. Yes. It's so, so good. Such a good cliffhanger. It is. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. This, this mm-hmm. whole section is the last couple, this last, you know, two uh, interlude and in end of the last chapter is so, to me, it feels like that quiet moment. Like if you're watching a movie, like the quiet moment before you know the mu- the music is about to just hit you, and it's that little quiet before the storm, and mm-hmm. I am like, oh my gosh, I am so ready for Arc Eight, you guys. I am mm-hmm. like, oh, <laughs> I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I I found that uh, that line from earlier that Tattletale says, Nick. After mentioning the Endbringers a second time, Lisa, holy fuck, Lisa said, slapping the side of the steering wheel with her hands. I think of the Venom moving, da 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 da. Uh, twice you bring up the Endbringers in as many minutes. You're being morbid. What's going on? Just like slammed on the brakes, <laughs> just stopped the car. Yeah. Like, yeah, just elicits yeah. that response. Yeah. But that is for another Ooh. episode. <laughs> I'm so excited. Also, uh, fun fact um, if, Obviously, these books are uh, they're web serials, so they're available to read online uh, on Wild Bo's blog. Uh, but he has given permission to for people if you want a bound copy, you can like format it yourself. You cannot share the file uh, around, but you can have them printed yourself. And um, Arc Eight would be the end of Book One if we were to print them all out, yeah, which uh, actually mm, we are that doing. Makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So arc yeah. eight would be the end of, of book one. And then book two would start with arc nine. So we are we are basically finishing, you know, a whole uh, a whole a whole novel. A whole like, novel, basically. We are finishing a yeah. whole novel at this point. And I, I did print a copy of it for Alan. And it is a chunky boy, let me tell you. Up through arc eight, <laughs> it is chunky. We've done very well for ourselves so far. I'm very proud of all we of us. Have. And yep. these were the short arcs. <laughs> it only gets longer from here. <laughs> it does. But more exciting. Yeah. Well, uh, any other final thoughts before we get into we'll we'll do our we'll do our classic favorite powers here, but any other final thoughts on the arc itself? Yeah. Uh, the whole point of this series is kind of like talking about, you know, blurring lines and morally gray people overall. Um, and it really got me thinking about uh, the decisions that, you know, the moral decision that most of the undersiders make in leaving Dinah there. Mm-hmm. Um, and how different, or I, I should say, the, like how different as a not different, heroes are from the villains in this world. Mm-hmm. Um, because all the heroes, for the most part, are looking out for themselves in one way or another. Um, you know, but but it's a noble thing in certain contexts. Brian, for, you know, basically until uh, the, I think it's the Empire 88 incident with Purity running around, you know, is a really good guy. He's there to protect people. He doesn't want to kill anybody. He's like, you know, even when civilians are involved with the Bakata incident, like he doesn't want people to get hurt and he's willing to go out of his way to prevent them from dying. Like, because he's a good guy, but Mm -hmm. he also is not doing this because that goes outside of his realm of like, it's too far for him to be comfortable to endanger his position to help Dinah. Um, Same is probably true of Lisa you know, bitch is a little bit different, but, you know, you got dog brain going on there. Mm-hmm. And Alec is, yo, man, not my, you know, not my problem, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But I think about the heroes and I think about, you know, probably, and I think this is more telling, you know, the future, 
but you know, from what we've seen the heroes, like there are some of them that are in it to be probably genuinely good people. But as we've like talked with Pansia, like Pansia is there because like kind of she's just forced to. Well, she can't sleep at night if she doesn't. Yeah, she feels like like yeah, it's she's literally like she is the superhero Catholic, if you will. (laughs) Like she has, I think, I think it's called scrupulosity, where you have this moral compunction that if you don't like, if you see trash on the side of the road and you don't pick it up, that is like a moral weight on your head that just hangs Mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Um, And she essentially has that because with great power comes great responsibility and she has healing powers and she's not doing it 24 seven. Like people are dying, but she talks about like, man, I don't think like, like the way impression you get is like, man, if I didn't have any of this pressure, like, you know, inside of me, I probably wouldn't do this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. I probably would just mind my own business and use it to heal. Like, Oh yeah. Oh, my friend just cut her finger, you know, cutting vegetables out here. Let me get that for you. Like that's the extent of pansy would like go to in her normal life. If she wasn't like brought up in a superhero household and kind of pressured to be a superhero. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I want, you know, makes me wonder how many other heroes uh, have that same mentality. You know, we can make assumptions about arms master for now. Um, Cause he kind of is just a dickhead, but also not wrong. You know, our feelings <laughs> on arms master are complicated. <laughs> and in this case, like, like how many other heroes have that thing? where, like, man, if they weren't a hero, like literally they just weren't in the wards or the proctorate. Like, would they be putting themselves out all that much in order to help someone else? Mm. Or are they just heroes because they are literally on the hero team? Right. Right. Which I think is a lot, is a lot of what this series is about is just, man, if it weren't for them being on this team or in this situation, is what they're doing bad or seen as bad or, you know, would this be an issue or condemned as hard if it weren't for the fact that like, Oh, well they're a villain. So like, of course what they're doing is bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with that too, we know that the wards program exists, which is meant to bring in, you know, those young heroes. Is that a form of child abuse in a way, you know, using kids to save people? Yeah. Putting yeah. kids in makes, life makes situations. you kind of wonder, like, if you're a hero and you are, you know, we have Shadow Stalker as the example of like she was doing her own thing, very much what Taylor kind of wanted to do. Very rogue. And you know, she went. Apparently, she went. You know, too far. But who's to determine what that means necessarily? She went too far a few times, and they were like, "Hey, it's Juvie." Or the wards. Or the wards. Yeah. I'm like, okay, what kind of decision is that? You you either get to be somebody who's kind of above the law a little bit, representative of it, or the person who's locked up by it. Like right. that yeah. that's your options. You don't get to be anything in between. And yeah. you know, makes you wonder, like, oh yeah, did Taylor have to take that into consideration of like, I don't know if I really want to be, you know, in the wards. Because that's just kind of you're forced to be part of that. Yeah. And if she wanted to see if she could do it on her own first before even approaching that. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I guess the question of like, I mean, with we see it with Canary is like, how much freedom do you have if you decide you don't want to be a cape, but you have powers? Like, you don't really have an option. Like, either way, you're going to be under immense amount of observation and scrupulation. And, mm-hmm. and it's just, you don't really have a choice. So are you going to fight for the good guys or the bad guys? And if you happen Mm -hmm. to be in a situation where all of a sudden you have powers now, and especially with powers like, like bitch, where you just, you make monsters, like you don't really have a choice anymore. Your choice has been stripped away. And, and the idea of a trigger event being triggering as it is, it's, it's hard enough as it is. And now, now you're even more so forced to 
to, to, to live a life that you didn't necessarily want or ask for. Mm-hmm. Well, going all the way back to, you know, talking about is having powers taboo? I don't think having powers is taboo. I think you're just sorted. Yeah. Like there's yeah. no, yeah. it's, if you have powers, you have to be one, one of, of the these other. things. Yeah. And, you know, that's if you are not one of those things, then it's then you're a pariah. Then it's, you know, you could maybe make it like Canary did. But but I imagine that's an oddity. Like, Mm. I think most people are forced to be one or the other, whether they like it or not. What a note to end on. Well, let's end on a more positive note. What are your favorite yeah. superpowers from this new arc? New superpowers yeah. only, please. New superpowers. <laughs> I got a few to choose from. Yeah, we do. We really do. I mean, I think I've uh, I've given away the game. <laughs> I was going to yeah. say, I think, I think Knight, we know next. Knight is just... I mean, there's a lot of cool powers. I like... Uh, oh, what What is his name? Storm Tiger? Is that his name? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Storm, Storm Tiger. Tiger. Yep. Storm yep. Tiger's power seems cool. Hook Wolf is weird, um, but I mean, Crusader is kind of funny, but I, I mean, you just can't beat, you can't beat, can't beat it, can't beat Knight. What a whack power. I love it. Yeah, I kind of want to agree with that. I, I'm i just very drawn to Knight as the the unseen monster, as the, as the weeping angel, you know, she just being able to. To, to to be the the monster in the darkness kind of thing. And I yeah. love that so much. I, I will say just to vary it up a little bit, I really like Hook Wolf. I really like the idea mm-hmm. of a Swiss army <laughs> Swiss Army wolf. Uh <laughs> you know, that that he has all of these, you know, hooks and blades and weapons that can shift out that are, you know, in a way kind of like um oh shoot, uh oh shoot, what's his name? Uh uh, Logan, uh, uh, Wolverine. Thank you, Jesus. Basically, like Wolverine. <laughs> like you got all these metal. <laughs> thank you. You thank got you. his actual name before the. I know. I, was, I know. Really, I know. Impressive. <laughs> I was thinking of the movie because the movie was so fucking good. Uh, but like yeah. with kind of that the metal uh, skeleton underneath and all these like shifting yeah, blades yeah. and stuff underneath the skin that can just kind of like come out. And I just that's so scary, but it's so cool. I I love the idea of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw another vote in for for Night and Fog. They were by far the I think they stole the show for me in terms of powers. I will give a shout out to uh, uh, New Wave, who we really didn't talk about at all. They're kind of get they kind of mentioned in passing in this in this arc, yeah. but they do engage with purity. But it was kind of cool just for another another plug for another team that works well together. It was cool just seeing them mentioned uh, a few more members of that team as well beyond just Glory Girl um, and getting to see them kind of fight together was was fun to read but did not top uh night and fog for me seeing them <laughs> seeing their team up was was pretty fun mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah night apps i you know i love the app once again lisa's description and then being like also that's wrong but it's the best the we can do we can come up with. yeah uh you know great but in terms of like visuals you know hard you know things that happen the hook wolf is just so freaking badass. Like they shoot him and in the hole, you realize it didn't go far because there's just a shifting metal underneath. Yeah. And <laughs> he, he literally is just constantly like unfolding a Swiss army knife and he can just do that to get bigger and turn into, you know, the hook wolf part of that. Like, yeah, becomes mm-hmm. very, you know, animal shaped and ooh. It's just that's 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 something to tangle with right there. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> for sure, sure for sure. This is fun. We're gonna have a lot to choose from oh. coming up. Oh man, oh. is is I think I really do feel like this is the time that we need to be built, build in that spreadsheet of capes because Arc A, <laughs> right. you guys get ready, take notes for Arc A. I'm gonna have to because oh, it's yeah. gonna be. Oh my gosh, listeners, a, get ready, get ready. There's a, there's a few people. Oh, just a few, just a few. Just a few. Yeah, well, we've, we've teased it. The story's teased it. Arcade is uh, a highlight for many, many Worm fans. So for oh, yeah. anyone reading along with us, uh, it's going to be a fun ride. Stick around. Uh, we are going to do the full Arc 8 in the next episode. 
uh, all the way through the interludes. So read along with us. And uh, did I miss any any final thoughts? Any parting words from any of you guys? Thank you all for, for joining so. in today. Stick around for part two of episode seven here, uh, where we're going to we're gonna approach the arc again from an adaptation perspective. But uh, then moving forward from that, we're going to break out that uh, part of the podcast into a separate episode, which will release um, not back-to-back with the book club, just because four to five hour long podcast episodes probably aren't too, <laughs> too convenient <laughs> for most people. And like we said, these arcs only get longer. So, yeah. so you don't want to listen to them. Michael doesn't want to edit them. It's all, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. And uh, I, I would say since we are missing um, our, our first time readers today, having uh, Kat and Taylor gone for this episode, uh, we, you know, we would really love to hear what you guys think is, is yes. going to happen next. Like with this next big arc happening, for those of you who have read it, uh, spoilers free comments, please. And for those of you that haven't, like, I, I want to know your predictions. Hit, hit us up. Hit us up. Indeed. And uh, with that, we'll let, the, we'll let the cliffhangers hang. Go out there, get reading, come back and listen <laughs> next time. <laughs> it's going to take a minute. It's going to be a fun ride. Again, thanks for everyone. Uh, everyone here for con- contributing. A lot of fun. Thanks for everyone for listening. Uh, feel free to reach out to us as, as Hannah said on any of our uh, any of our socials. We'd love to hear from you. And Michael, want to play us out? And welcome back to another episode of Dissecting Worm, I think as we are officially calling it. We've had some meetings. Yeah, yep, we yep, like yep. it. A little, little on the nose, but uh, where myself, Jacob, uh, and my co-host as normal, Alan, welcome back. We are... Uh, Never normal. <laughs> we, are, we are going through Worm arc by arc and attempting to adapt it for television, ideally in some form or another. And uh, we've got an interesting arc here because as we dive into the end of what we've kind of talked about being the, the end of season one, as we approach the end of this hypothetical first season, we reach probably the mm. first, in my opinion, the first arc where most of this can be cut. And this is kind of scary because up until this point... It feels like we've had a uh, a bit of an easy time where the arcs are kind of already, we've talked about them being sort of framed and written for adaptation in this medium. So it's been sort of easy to just say, well, this is episode one. These are episode two. And uh, now we have to start, now we're, now we're starting to play that game. Like we have 1.6 million words and 30 arcs to trim down. We got to start somewhere. But uh what are your what are your thoughts, Alan? Yeah, I mean, we the biggest point we had to do this before was substituting slash taking out about half an arc, you know, all the way back with the mm-hmm. Bakuda fight. Um, I think it's like arc mm-hmm. four, and I think that this is gonna be more difficult because that that's the that's the back half of the chapter. Keep the front half, cut off the back half, easy peasy, mm-hmm. done. The problem with this one is. I think you can cut about half of it, but it's about every other chapter. And that's what makes <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, there's a lot there's a lot of good in here that I would certainly want to keep, but you're right, it's very uh spread out uh, throughout the arc. Um but let's just kind of go through it uh, roughly in reading order here just to sort of tackle a few things. Um I do really love Taylor and Bitch's dynamic with the dogs um it's a good i, mean, I was gonna say it's it a good bit of character right. development it's a nice bit of payoff for their characters um it works pretty well 
It's certainly something I would want to keep. It could, I could certainly see it being much shorter. Um, but I definitely wouldn't want to cut the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I think because we had such an action packed episode mm-hmm. last right. time, I think that ending it, and I, we, we've been going pretty well with like action, character development, you know, action, character development, mm-hmm. back and forth. Uh, and I think this, you know, being, having the action time last time, this is the time for a little bit of quiet. Um, so, you know, and of course, probably going to split this into two episodes just because how it is. Um, starting with the quiet part. And even though there's a little bit of engagement, it's nothing big when they deal with the Empire 88 guys mm-hmm. showing up. Right. Um, I don't feel like it's that uh, that big of a conflict. Yeah. No, the only thing with that that is kind of fun, although, again, this would be really easy to put in literally any other fight, but I do like uh, Taylor experimenting with her powers and sort of doing her first sort of clone, human clone shape with the bugs. This is the first time we kind of see that. Yeah. Um, but again, stuff like that would be really easy to <laughs> to drop in any other fight and sort of... Uh, play with that if, if this was something we ended up sort of trimming or cutting. Um, yeah. Do we have an opener for this one? You know, I was thinking about that and I don't, I mean, I don't think it's that clear. I think there's a, a lot of things we could do. I think this would be a really good episode for one of our interlude openings that maybe we've put off or are waiting for or um, you know, if you wanted to cold open an extra scene with characters, depending on you know how much time you wanted to give to somebody else. Maybe we give a little scene to the wards here. Maybe this is, uh, you know, who knows what you could put. A, you could put a lot of things here. I think there's a. I think there's some room. Yeah, I have an idea. We love ideas, um, but I'm not sure if it should go at this one or maybe the second half of this because we're dividing this up. We divide up. Of course, at probably like 0. 0.6, mm-hmm. 0. 0.7. And that's uh, after the mall. And then, you know, they get the call like, oh my gosh, Empire 88 got doxxed yeah. and <laughs> Purity's yep. flipping out. Um, like, that could be the point. Uh, if we did, I've got an idea for an interlude because we're, t- I think we're technically caught up on interludes. Yeah, we've I used both the, of them. We, most we of basically them. said after the Canary one, the Canary one just needs to get yep. bumped later. Because I think Canary just fits later in introducing the birdcage. Mm-hmm. Um, I think having the PRT set up for like this SWAT-like mm-hmm. maneuver to bust into a place, and then it turns out they're just kicking in Theo and Astor's mm-hmm. apartment. Mm-hmm. And you know, absconding with the say, kids. So you're basically creating creating the interlude, but that's just kind of alluded to off screen in the in the text there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that would be a really good. Uh, I mean, you could even yeah, a really remind good me. It, it we, have to be yeah, no, big. no. Did we? Um, because the the purity interlude from a few arcs ago. Did we decide to cut that, or did we decide to put that somewhere? Because I think. I already wrote it, so like it's in there. <laughs> yeah, like it, it. It if if it anything was going to be cut, I think it would. But I think going forward, I think having Theo be a character. Yeah, well, he yeah, he definitely is is, uh, is a choice that should be made. Like, um, you know, it's Kaiser's son. He also is a very interesting. You know, not very much like mm-hmm. his dad, as it said. You know, he's showed up. Cons, you know enough that I think he warrants maybe having uh, more of a centering mm-hmm. point than because uh, you know we even uh, Wild Bo even talked about you know what, what was some of his alternative main characters right, that he can right. you know was considering Theo was one of them right you know like oh yeah you know I was considering well, you know a bunch of characters and. Sure, like I think he's got a great story to tell. Why mm-hmm. not tell it? Yeah, 
No, I do agree with that. I, I, I love Theo as a character and I think introducing him early is smart. Um, as all good stories do, you always want to, you always want to be building those characters throughout. Um, yeah. So then if we do show that earlier, then definitely I think some type of, of interlude showing the, the kidnappings, if you will, I think that would be pretty important. Um, however, yeah, that kind of begs the question, how much of the back half of this arc do we cut? Uh, okay. So if we're going to go to the back half, cause I think we agree. You just need to have, uh, I think we could cut maybe this CQC training. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Like the wrestling yeah, around with yeah, crew. No, I, would, I think you cut I think that. We cut that. Um, it's a little repetitive. We maybe just dive. Ah, oh, man. We've also got to have the heartbreaker reveal. That's the other thing. Um, there's actually a couple <laughs> reveals in here that I, I have, I have a little bit of uh-huh. trouble with. One of which is, I think that, Co- like I, I have, tr- I have problems with Coil's reveal so early. Yeah, but I also, I guess it leads into these issues. It just, it does feel a little bit weird. Um, I like the the problems it's going mm-hmm. to set up later uh, in Arc mm-hmm. Eight. Um, the character, you know, character problems. But well, I mean, I guess at the end of Seven, yeah, the issues at the end of Seven with Dinah, like. I love that it sets that up. It just feels a little early mm-hmm. to me. And I don't know how to resolve yep. that. Um, no, I, I absolutely agree. I think, I think some of those moments could be condensed for the end of the season. Um, we're going to stay away from Arc 8, even though I know we both talked before this episode started that we have already read it. <laughs> so we are making a lot of these decisions with that arc in mind. But there's a lot to still do probably multiple episodes um, just within Arc 8 and what comes out. So I think, I think uh, Dinah and a lot of that can be pushed. I'm not worried about getting it done now pre-Arc 8. Yeah, a lot of that can be pushed. I think, uh, what were you saying before that? Uh, the Heartbreaker reveal. Yeah, where was that again? That was in... Uh, Coil reveals it. Uh, oh, that's, that's right. What, it's like, in it's in that same. You know, the, yep, you're right. Yeah, it's like what does everybody want? And it's like going through all yep. the different things, and you know, it's revealed that like, oh yeah, like, and Alec doesn't want to have to deal with his dad, so I'm making sure that doesn't right. happen. Right. Yeah, it's tricky, and I think this is where we're gonna get to have some fun with uh, what we choose to adapt here, yeah. um, because. Uh, yeah, we also don't spend that much time with yeah. with Alec in this exactly. it, it, for a little bit. So I think I think maybe having a bigger mm-hmm. moment with him, maybe we yep. reveal no, I that. agree. I think I think that'd be better placed elsewhere. Okay, so yeah, let's just say for now, pretty much everything with Coil in this arc would get pushed. Yeah. Or repurposed. I think maybe having the re- you could still have the reveal of like well, we'll get to it later. We'll have the reveal that like Coil used them to get mm-hmm. Dinah, but and you could still have that mm-hmm. conflict. But this is you know this is the bigger mm-hmm. issue uh, of like all we know is Coil used them to kidnap her, um, and maybe you we could reveal that the travelers are working for Coil. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and I think because remember. I think I really liked our idea of if we did want to push the coil reveal from the last arc, just having the travelers show up and uh, and saving the undersiders from Armors Master and them, and then just sort of continuing that, hey, we have the same boss sort of attitude. Yeah, yeah. Because you could, you could maybe even still have the like, the real veal be like coil being like, yeah, like, when I sent the travelers to go kidnap this girl, you know, just like I sent them to rescue you that Mm -hmm. one time. And then she's like, Oh my gosh. Like, so you're the one that has Mm -hmm. us, you know, under here. And, and maybe even, maybe even coil susses out the ender, the end bringer thing. Um, Maybe coil isn't caught off guard by that. Uh, Oh, I I don't think he would be. Cause you got to have something that's, 
you've got to have something that's it's there because it's a right. one-two punch. It's a bunch of coil stuff revealed at the beginning mm-hmm. and the end, and then immediately we're going yeah. into other things. Well, and the problem too is is because Taylor sort of pieces together, uh, you know, the oh my god. Coyle's been manipulating our group the whole time, the bank robbery and timing that all up. Like it, it sort of builds to a really fun, really impactful moment for Taylor to realize that like, holy hell, I am a villain. <laughs> I have been doing villain things, working for a villain. Like this is sort of a big thing for her. So I think that that sort of makes sense to give her that moment. Um, when it's appropriate. And if we're, if we're going to sort of, you know, sort of uh, handle Coyle's initial reveal differently, I think it would make sense to sort of rope a lot of that together so that you get mm. the big, huge mastermind reveal tied with uh, Taylor's realization that uh, she's just been kind of a pawn in all of this so far. Um, we do have an interlude in this chapter, though. Yeah. We have the um, uh, Miss Militia interview. Yeah, that's right. Okay, yeah, because here's here's the. I mean, I guess the big thing here is like, when do we put that? I need to look at my notes. On I'll that be honest. Now. I think that's uh, another one we cut. I like Miss Militia as a character. I think her sort of story is interesting, but I think it gets dwarfed uh, by everything else we have going on. But that being said, I do like that the interlude touches on uh, their plan, especially Arms Master and Dragon's plan for detecting the Endbringers. It just sort of, it yeah. just gives this gravitas to the whole world. Um, that like, they have a spark of hope against these things. And I yeah. love that sort of dread in, oh, hey, our our alarm worked. Oh fuck. It worked. Like it's just it's a great little moment. And uh I think we gotta keep that okay. somehow. So I like that. I would like to do two things with it. Hit me. Number one, I think I think we keep the PRT as the opener for the the kidnapping okay. the kids. Okay. Opener for part one. Episode two of this, we open with uh Hannah having her quick flashback. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know. And once again, because it's visual, we can do that pretty quickly. True. Yep, good point. She wakes up from her dream. You know, uh, whether or not we want to include... I, I think, you know what? I think we do the inclusion of the big space thing. Mm, okay. The spacey sure. part of yep. her dream. And then have her wake up, do the like staring. And then like clearly you you can... They do that thing where like the character's frozen up, but then they start moving and it's clearly they've forgotten oh, whatever right. just happened. Yeah, I gotcha. Yep. And you could even have it be as explicit of like walks in to, you know, Colin and Dragon talking and they're like, hey, like what's got you up? She, like She's like dreaming and, you know, Dragon goes, anything interesting? She goes, I don't yeah, remember. Right. Yeah, you can play it off pretty easily. And I think having them sitting there working on that, you know, the very quick breakdown of, you know, what's going on, the inner politics, mm-hmm. I think those are pretty good. And then have them put together a thing and... Be like, yeah, we've got this. And then, you know, on the big screen, we like slowly zoom in. And much like our our teaser with the water mm-hmm. before, we just have like the little mm-hmm. ping. And then cut yeah. worm. Then at the end, sirens are going off. We move out from just the undersiders having their reactions to it. But we have quick, like a quick montage of everybody all the groups we've mm-hmm. encountered, people on the street, PRT, wards, other villains, all turning, reacting, suiting up, rushing mm-hmm. out. And one of, and it kicks it off is Arms Master running in front of the machine and being like, oh my God, like yeah. it's on the way. Yeah. Like, oh, I mean, I think you have to. I think that is the cliffhanger of the episode. I think there's no, there's no way around that. Um, yeah, and absolutely need to show everyone's sort of response to the alarms. I mean, I think one thing that makes this story so great and so unique is are these little moments like this. Like, what other what other property has this type of event where your heroes and your villains 
are just in unanimous agreement immediately to put aside everything else to address this threat. Like just the nature of that is so unique. It is such a golden opportunity for some really good like character beats and moments and pauses. Uh, yeah, some type of, yeah. you know, like you yeah. said, montage or something like that to show, yeah. show everyone. Because I don't like the whole mm-hmm. thing. I don't like them all, that, that, that whole interlude taking place at the end and then immediately mm-hmm. going into it. I, I just don't mm-hmm. think it fits there. But I think you do have to have it come back up. Mm-hmm. And I think just having it at the beginning and the end yeah, of the episode is that works. perfect for uh, it. I would also, I'm going to throw this out there. But I think if we end up cutting most of the Empire 88 fight, as we've sort of alluded to, then I think there's, you could probably condense this into one episode. Ooh. I think if you start and end both with the alarm, uh, I think pretty much everything else, I think you could fit it in. I think you have dog shelter. Yeah. I think you, you have, know, I think I, you I think still do. Right. You can have their interaction with Sophia, which I think is really important for later payoffs. And I think uh, that's about it. I think if we wanted to, this is a good episode where you can sort of stretch them things out. If you want to throw in a couple extra scenes, if you want to throw in a scene, like I was saying, with other characters, I think this is a good time to do it. Um, but other, th- I, think, I think there's enough here to, to put... Or one episode, but not more. Especially if you, because if, if you cut the fight, that is in terms of just what would take the longest to show. I think that would, that's most of your episode. Yeah. Well, I, okay. So there's, this is the problem I have with this. It's two fights, mm-hmm. um, back to back, a lot of characters. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but neither of them are resolved fights, mm-hmm. if you will. They're they're resolved at a third fight You're right. off screen. <laughs> right. Yeah. So so what you have is uh you know, Gru and Skitter showing up, you know, going through mm-hmm. in an ambulance, and out of nowhere they get yep. hit on accident <laughs> yeah. by some Empire yep. 88 people. Hook Wolf, Storm Tiger, Cricket. Now, Storm Tiger and Cricket, you know, say what you want about them. They're they're kind of cool. Hook Wolf is our main dude here. Mm-hmm. Um, he's the one talking. He's the one, you know, he's kind of in charge. Uh, I think it being a completely by accident, I, I don't even know if we need to show them seeing the mm-hmm. ambulance, like them looking inside. That could just be like some other fight is going on. Hook Wolf, Storm Tiger, and Cricket are fighting New Wave mm-hmm. or something. Um, and one of them gets thrown into the mm-hmm. ambulance and Gru's like, fuck, you know, but then they get the ambulance up and going. Or if you wanted to have them interact with them a little bit more, they, you know, the ambulance gets wrecked. They, you know, crawl out and Storm Tiger and whatnot is like, oh, well, well, look at what do we have here. And the whole, the whole fight there isn't a, a drawn out thing. It's Gru and Skitter trying to run away and get in like get in another mm-hmm. car essentially yeah. um and you can still have the like crickets disrupting the uh the the bugs you can still have storm tiger maybe you know show off his power once or twice and hook wolf you know be big bad as he mm-hmm. is you know and the enhanced senses through the fog but you don't have to spend more than like maybe 2 minutes there especially if you just have them fleeing Like, all they're trying to do is get away from these three motherfuckers. So, here's an idea. And uh, I'm going to spitball for a moment. But I am envisioning completely cutting all of that. Hook Wolf, Night and Fog, everything. Okay. If we restructure this a little bit, because I, I agree. Not only is it two fights, not only is it the hook will fight into the night and fog, into the third off-screen fight, but even before that, there, it's still action with Taylor Bryan, 
and Sophia. And before that, it's tense with like, it's, it's just a little much. But what, yeah. what if, because yeah, I, I, I really like your idea of starting the entire, like uh, uh, starting the episode off with post, post the, um, uh, the alarm system, but with the kidnapping. So what if after that, the rest of the episode is still building off of that, but but in in pieces. So, for example, Bitch and Taylor, mm. the Empire eighty eight guys show up, and they realize that they are there specifically with orders to kill Bitch because what the audience and everyone doesn't know is that Purity has put out a hit on the Undersiders, blaming them for the kidnappings. So. The Empire 88 group guys, they show up to take care of Bitch, maybe a little ahead of schedule, trying to get a little eager and get beaten back. Mm -hmm. Then when Brian shows up, uh, they're trying to piece together what's going on. They call Tattletail. Tattletail is like, yep, pieces it together. But, and this is where I'm going to kind of, I'm adjusting a lot of stuff here. Let's say at that moment, Tattletail is like, guys, Purity found me. And so you skip everything else so now Brian and, and Taylor are trying to rush over towards Tattletail and they get caught by Sophia. They have that interaction while Tattletail deals with Purity and you get, and you get Tattletail and Purity's conversation, which I, I, do, I do really like their conversation that they have. So you can keep those moments. Everything else sort of plays out the same, but you're just essentially eliminating all of the middle of that fight, which shortens the episode. Uh, it takes away some of the unnecessary jumps from fight to fight, but still sort of carries the tension that this whole episode has, which is that Empire 88, specifically Purity, wants the Undersiders dealt with. Okay, uh, follow-up. Mm -hmm. I, I like that. I, I was just, I'll be honest, I was just trying to keep Night and Fog in there because they're, they're <laughs> well, so cool. And, uh, I do love them too. This is this is and truth this is so hard. Yeah. We gotta cut so much. It's so hard because they're they're honestly they don't kind of matter. They don't. Uh, I'm sorry, man. They're, they're, we're, we got the problem with having so many cool characters. I know, it's so hard. I was I was looking okay. through a list. There's there's so many, but again, yeah. we can we can put them elsewhere. Yeah. Um. I think if you keep any character, you keep Hook Wolf just because. Yeah. He, like he's a little more important. Yeah. Yeah. But. Let's stick with your your idea. So instead of starting with the bitch thing, you start with Brian and uh, Taylor out on their out on their trip. Mm -hmm. You kick it off with the Sophia thing. Taylor's in a pissy mood. Mm -hmm. On top of that, you know, friend, whatever. They just end up. Uh, this isn't them going to hide mm -hmm. or whatnot. This just kicks off with them hanging out. Okay. They end up deciding just, you know, hey, we're going to head back to the hideout. Um, Taylor and Bitch go do their thing. People show up. Taylor lets off a little steam, maybe a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. uh, beating the shit out of some Nazis. You know, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> and then, then they realize like, oh, shoot, what's happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Phone call, you know, Grew to get there, calls Tattletail, and Tattletail's like, hey, Purity found me. Uh huh. Yeah, that works. And that's where you can be like, oh my gosh, you know what's going on? She's like, I think I know where the kids are. I'll be honest, every time I read the whole Purity section, mm -hmm. I know that it happens and my brain like intentionally wipes it out because mm -hmm. I just don't care all that much. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's it's a weaker part of the story up to this point, which is... A, and it's difficult yeah. because it's a whole other thing happening, specifically against New Wave. Mm -hmm. um, that There's a whole other adventure happening there. Right. And perhaps, like, if we're, if, you know, heaven forbid we should keep that, maybe we focus on how Glory Girl and her family are doing over there. Right, yeah. No, and of course, that's the, like, that's a whole other route you could go here pretty easily. You would have to write a lot of stuff into the into the episode, but but yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, and then, too, uh, in addition to that, of course, 
this is this is where it's going to get a bit tricky. Where I think when we step back post arc eight and do our season one recap episode, um, I think a lot of this might fall into place a bit easier because we are still sort of containing all of these conversations one arc at a time, which can get tricky, especially as we want to sort of move pieces around. Um, because now, like, as you're saying that, I'm like, oh, this is good. That's actually like that a lot. It sort of juggles the uh, tension throughout the episode. But now we kind of want a little bit at the end. Do we, do we move the coil reveal here? But I'm like, no, nah, I don't think that works. So I think, I think these are things that might, might get answered as we, as we pace out the whole season in terms of where we want certain, certain story beats to land. Like, where do we... When, when we end up, for example, placing the coil reveal, right? I think that's going to sort of domino effect with a lot of the foreshadowing and stuff that we want leading up to that. We might go back and say like, okay, well, if coil is going to be revealed here, then here is where we want to put, you know, the travelers. Uh, here is where we want, you know, stuff like that kind of might fall into place a bit easier. Um, and I think a lot of that's going to happen here. Yeah. Uh there's just a there's a a lot of climax that I'm you know in this arc mm-hmm. that we need to work to with purity essentially being the main conflict. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out how to get to there. Um well, I think part of the hard thing too is is that really purity is not that big of a character at this point. Like we've yeah. seen her He's spoken a couple times, but we only really know her as Kaiser's not wife and mother of Aster. Like that's it. That's, yeah, that's what she is. So like, her, okay. Her, so maybe we have yeah. maybe we have some dynamic going on here because um, this essentially needs to be like a hostage negotiation. Mm-hmm. I think having a three-way conversation between New Wave, the Undersiders, and Empire 88 come to, like, literally come to a head where the Undersiders show up in a car and are like, hey, mm-hmm. it's me. I'm the one you want. I can figure, you know, Lisa going like, I, I can tell you where they me. are. Yeah. Yeah. And New Wave being like, shut the fuck up. Right. No, you don't. And also, like... You know what the hell are you doing? Yeah, I I really um, don't mind trying to put some more new wave in here, which I know is scary because that would mean we've got to try to flex some of our riding muscles. Uh, but yeah. but I I mean I think we've I think it only makes sense given that we've already given more uh, screen time to Glory Girl and Panacea, who are only going to yeah. get more as the story goes on. Like I think it makes sense. To I think show this here. is a perfect time to maybe have Panacea or Glory Girl. Maybe even, but yeah, maybe keep Panacea as the one watching Theo and Aster, mm. like with PRT troopers. Mm-hmm. Like maybe she's there. Maybe Theo and uh, Amy have a conversation with each other. Yeah, that would be interesting. You know, yep. you know, and you you know interject between them talking. And then maybe Glory Girl and you know her aunt dealing with Lisa and Purity, and then you know them coming to a resolution mm-hmm. somehow, whether it's just you know grabbing Tattletail and flying to the secret base, and then you know it gets kicked in, and you know Tattletail or Purity is like, "What are you going to stop me from taking my kid back?" And Pansy is like, "Nah." Yeah. <laughs> Not about to do yeah. that. Yeah. Not worth it. Yeah. No, I, I do like that. I, I like giving them some more, some more growth in the arc. Plus, yeah. we can, in the distance, because they're not major characters at all, but you could show more of New Wave too. You could show some of the other family members that are there. Um, I think, yeah. I think also playing up the fact that this is, and maybe even it's done differently, this is the kidnapping of a child. Mm-hmm. And we're about to end this on an argument mm-hmm. about the kidnapping of a child. Yep. yep. And I think discussing how like either both are wrong 
or one is okay and one isn't or you, you know mm-hmm. showing that like oh yeah when heroes do it it feels okay to you the audience mm-hmm. but when a villain kidnaps a child it doesn't feel right right and i have some issues like i don't know how i feel about the keeping dinah on drugs thing yeah <laughs> the uh we haven't really had one of these moments yet, but it won't be the last time where we have to really talk about like how dark do we want the show to get? Yeah. It's a different medium. It's um, an entirely different medium. And there's a lot that you can get away with in literature that's not nearly as intense when you don't have to when there's no visual representation of it. Yeah. I'll be honest, a lot of that doesn't bother mm-hmm. me. Uh yeah um but but the, the drugging children yeah, the, doesn't bother me all that much how does that uh how does that uh community quote or what's it i can excuse racism but i draw the line at at i forgot what it was animal cruelty or something like that yeah you, yeah. Can, excuse, you can excuse racism yeah, exactly <laughs> uh that's that's just you were to mark that down that's just gonna be a meme but everything with like taylor yeah. <laughs> Just uh, an ongoing I can excuse list. Excuse ch- child kidnapping, yeah. but I draw the line at child kidnapping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel like we just need to keep that and just add to it as the episodes go on. Yes. I can excuse this, yes. this, 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 this. <laughs> I draw the line at this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that'll be, we'll have to, we'll play around with some of that and figure out what works best. Yeah. I think, I think we need to have another thing that needs to get punched up a little bit is uh move bumping up the Lisa maybe feeling um uh playing up how Lisa feels about Empire 88 getting outed. Mm-hmm. Um is this her fault? Um does she feel like it's her fault directly? Like because yeah, that's what she did. She helped gather information, she knew what it was going to be used for, or does she feel bad because she didn't know what it was going to get used for? Right. And she's kind of gotten blindsided. Right. In which case, is her volunteering potentially to, hey, take me to purity so I can resolve this and you know, be her hostage? Is that her amending that guilt? Is that, yeah. you know, what are we going to see out of her character? Yeah. There? No, that's a good point. Um, and again, I think this is something that's going to be helpful when we're kind of doing a bigger sort of wide look at the season. But I do think that aside from Brian, who's had some decent development, um, the Undersiders don't really have that much development. Bitch a little bit, but it's still more of like a character type. Um, but Taylor specifically... A lot of it's character exposition. Yeah, and Taylor specifically, or Taylor, uh, Tattletale. Uh, specifically, I think could benefit from a few more of those moments. So I think this this would be a good time for that. Um, no, I like that a lot. So I think with with that, and I would still want to sort of workshop how we would want to structure the episode. But I I like the idea of starting starting with uh, Leviathan d- detection and uh, going from there to. I liked your idea of going from there to. Uh, Brian and Taylor getting that done first. That whole run-in with Sophia, uh, Brian's rejection, <laughs> and all of that drama um, into the rest, into the bitch and her dog scene, into purity with Tattletail. And honestly, I think I'll, I think all of that's going to take a good bit of time. I think that takes most of the episode. And then, if you want to fill in some gaps with. Uh, some more new wave scenes, a little bit of a little bit of breathing room there. I think that would fill out the episode pretty well. Yeah. Um, there's something else on a bigger scale, and obviously we'll talk more about this. But I think I, I feels weird the whole going into the secret layer. I think it feels very bad. Capping it off <laughs> with getting number one. You know, closing it off kind of with uh, purity runs off with the kids. The undersiders are left there mm-hmm. to get their shit together. I don't know. Maybe making this somehow a bigger deal. 
because we also have the Dyna problem. And that's kind of an argument that needs to be had and an issue that needs to be talked about. I don't think they need to go to the secret layer. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, if it would be a way weaker beat, but I think Taylor getting pissed off that Coil outed uh, Empire 88 to begin with. Mm -hmm. If, you know, once again, if she knows that he's her boss. Right, right. Like, that's a big no no. Yeah. I'll be honest, it's described as a really big no no. Right. And it's not really. I don't feel like we got the uh what's the word I'm looking for? The consequence mm-hmm. for the action that we should have gotten. Because we've talked about what has happened to even heroes that have yeah. you know gone after villains in their own home. Well, and and again the heroes also have a reaction to this that should be pretty aggressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and and again, this is this is what makes I think this is just one of Wildbo's strengths as a writer is like everybody already is sort of known by everybody. I mean, the readers already sort of understand, right. The consequences of having uh, a superhero's identity revealed, like it's baked into every other story we read. So it's, you don't have to spell that out for the audience that like, Oh no, this group got their identity revealed. And that means they're going to be targeted. Like everybody just knows that. Like that's, that's the assumption. So you can skip all of that exposition. You can just go right into, oh, all of these guys got outed. And the audience is already on board. Everybody is already... You're, you're not sympathizing with the villains themselves, but you're sympathizing with the situation, which is, yeah. which I think is great. Um, yeah. Also, this is a perfect time to not have Coil be known yet mm-hmm. because all of a sudden Empire 88 gets out of it. We don't know by who, but what we do know is that Tattletail did it. Yep. And Tattletail feels terrible because Tattletail is essentially the one holding the smoking gun. Right. Yep. Like this is all information that she's gathered, she's put together, and was just used to do one of the, you know, taboo things. Mm-hmm the heroes would be coming after her, you know? Right. Like, everybody's going to be gunning for her. And I think the idea of, like, Taylor and them being like, what the fuck? Are we next? Like, right. what happens, you know, what happens if we outlive our usefulness? Do we get outed? Right, right. Well, and I'm, and this sort of plays into, yeah, the, I mean, obviously, if we really want to build up the coil reveal, too, because, like, I'm going to be honest, if I was watching this show, right, and I had never read Worm, and I'm watching this all unfold, and let's, you know, I mean, if we don't know who Coil is, we don't have any understanding of who their boss is, as an audience member, I might at this point go, hey, wait a minute, is Tattletail the actual mastermind? Is she the one controlling everything at this point? Like, Ooh. you could really play into some paranoia there. Um, yeah. And then, of course, I have mean, it'd, it, be, it'd be very tattletale yeah, was, right? Um, especially if, you're, if we're delaying the, re- the coil reveal. Um, and that could even play into the coil reveal, right? So, like, there's a lot of fun you can have with that. I mean, I was even thinking, like, we could even go back a bit to where we have the little meeting of villains back in Arc 4 or whatever that was. And what if Coil just doesn't show up for that? <laughs> what if he's just not there? Does he need to be there? Uh, maybe not. You know, maybe th- maybe there's... Uh, I think maybe having him there and just be the arbitrator. Like... True. Not do a whole yeah, lot. Or, yeah, exactly. We know he's got... Just downplay his... We know he's got soldiers. Yep. But I think hiding his powers, hiding his power levels... Yeah, just downplaying um, him a bit. Yeah, I think that's, that's probably wise. Uh, all that to say, though... Depending on depending on how much we want to put into the episode without overloading it, um, we could we could still do Dinah at the end and just keep it vague, or like you were saying, keep it so just Tattletail knows or or Tattletail reveals that she's figured it out. You know, whatever the yeah. case may be, you can still have that tension at the end. You can still have t- uh, Taylor's gripe with the group. Where they're all like, I mean, it's bad, but you know, 
we we have bigger problems. You can still have that whole sort of uh, dynamic there that yeah. that leads into the next arc. I, I think it's perfect because you can still have the same gripe of we endangered a child. Mm-hmm. Like, especially if Tattletale is trying to save a little bit of face mm-hmm. here. Where she's like, ah, yes, like, I mean, maybe I didn't mean to, but that's what happens. Sometimes you just got to roll with it and like roll with it. Like there were kids in the line of fire, potentially. Right. Like we we kidnapped children from their homes right. because of this. Um, we we outed people. That's something we said we'd never do. Like, how am I supposed to trust you to not out me? Mm-hmm. Like, make this an attack on Tattletale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I think is is really poignant for Tattletale and Taylor's relationship as we look later on. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's a great thing for Tattletale to be very forgiving of Taylor. Yeah, yeah. Um, given the situation and why she sticks with her and nobody else kind of does in this case. Yeah. Like, uh, everybody else is like, why are you making such a big deal out of this? We're villains. Mm-hmm. And Tattletale kind of going soft on Taylor. Right, right. Um, no, I agree. I like that. And then, and then you know, Storm's out. And maybe Tattletail is the one to go get her this time. Because before it's been Gru. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, we could have a very different dynamic where Taylor is once again storming out of the loft, which we've seen before, except this time it doesn't play out the same. Yeah, exactly. And then while they're outside, they have a little discussion. Maybe maybe Tattletale even reveals a little bit like, hey, this wasn't me. Right. I didn't make the choice to do this. Or maybe, maybe she was told to reveal the information. Maybe she had the information. Mm -hmm. She was sitting on it. And Coyle told her, do it. Right. So she does pull the trigger, but kind of under orders. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. I think it'd absolutely go that route. And I mean, this this plays into we we were talking about we kind of mentioned it before, but I think and I think we'll have a, a stronger conversation for our season one uh recap, but really sort of thinking about the themes of this season and the show. I think mm. I think it plays into all of them once we've talked about it. I think it plays into this illusion of power. I think it it plays into uh I mean I, I don't think we talked about this one, but I think a really obvious theme is bullying, to be blunt. But um mm. there's elements of that too. Like I I really, really like the way we're kind of working this ending here. You know, especially especially if you're building towards this massive distrust of Tattletale, where maybe yeah. Taylor and the audience are both like, ooh, she is way more in control of all of this than we think she is. And then the reveal is that, no, she is not. She is following orders, like one of Coil's snipers. <laughs> like, you know, she's just yeah. doing what she's yeah. told, just like everybody else. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like that. I'm I'm trying to think about this in the long run because I think the Dinah problem is going to be a reoccurring issue. Mm-hmm. And I kind of don't think we need her. <laughs> like I'm doing just a quick, mm-hmm. quick forward look and just, you know, what I'm feeling in my heart in terms of characters we can get rid yeah. of. I I think we can get rid of her or at least push her back a decent amount. Yeah. Let's definitely put a pin in that. I don't hate that actually at all, but, and obviously this is going to all come back to me more (laughs) as we read more here, but I, I do like the idea of coil sort of having a lot of these pieces on his hypothetical chessboard, um, that don't seem connected really. I mean, like just at the end of this episode, we have the undersiders, the travelers, and Dina and Coyle's army, you know, like he's got a yeah. lot of these pieces working towards working towards a goal. And I'm trying to stay vague because I did just read his interlude today and I don't want to get into it until the next episode. But 
um, I think having a lot of these pieces are really plays into his character's strength. But I don't hate the idea of getting rid of, of Dina. I think she's probably lowest on the list of chess pieces. Um, so we could definitely move that around. I'm going to make a note of that. Yeah. Because I don't hate that, but it's definitely something we'd want to we'd want to talk through as we get yeah. into Coil's arc. Because I don't think that Coil requires like like as much as it's played up here that like Dinah is such a linchpin for Taylor not liking Coil. Mm-hmm. I don't think you need Dinah to not like Coil. Oh no, not at all. I don't think so. I do think it it does help. The one thing it does do is that it does help the audience turn from, hey, wait a minute. Coyle's not entirely wrong. He's getting rid of the white supremacists and all the bad guys. And maybe he's got a point. Like it does prevent that. Because <laughs> you can't really justify drugging and kidnapping children. So like it does help on that front. Um, but I agree. I don't, I think there's other ways we can make the audience hate, hate coil. Yeah. Also, how do you feel about having one of the PRT officers Mm -hmm. that bust in and get the kids? One of them essentially walk away afterwards, put out, pull out a cell phone, like very clearly not to the PRT Mm -hmm. and be like, it's done. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I think that, I think that would work. Like maybe hint. I mean, I think we've already talked about that there, you know, People, I think Tattletales even talked about like, I mean, I think she was bluffing, but you know, like she's got informants mm-hmm. and you know, it's, it's coil. Like he's probably got people, yeah. even if it's a secretary on the inside. Like, yeah. Well, that's kind of the idea with him too, is again, he's got all these moving pieces. He's got all these different people in play. Um, he reminds me a lot of like little finger from game of Thrones where yeah. You know, he's he's just sort of sitting back and having conversations and making plays at power and everybody's sort of just not figuring it out, you know. Um Yeah. So no, I, I like that a lot. I think that I think that helps. Because again, like all things, you want you want to present everything in a way that the audience can figure it out and will figure it mm. out. Um, you know, shock is great but this isn't horror. So we do want our little mysteries to be able to be solved or at least when they're revealed, it's not like a, huh? It's a, oh, that makes sense, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, yeah, I think I think maybe going back and editing that, uh, the, the them having a conversation in the, the villain bar, oh, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. To to back his you know dial his stuff down a little bit. Yeah, I think that's smart. Um, maybe not even have the fault line thing. Mm-hmm. Like, because I think him trying to hire fault line maybe comes across too open in terms of his hiring people. Right. Well, and I I think you get um, enough of you know, that even even with that fight that immediately follows. Like you already see Coil's mercenaries, like. It's very clear that he's very well funded. Um, his men are very loyal, obviously, so they're paying him well, or they're getting paid well. I mean, um, yeah. like there's enough already there to suggest that Coil is is got some pretty a pretty smart head on his shoulders, you know. Yeah. Well, I like the idea of him being, you know, he's the paramilitary guy, mm-hmm. and I think as long as you keep that kind of separate, that like, what's his power? His power is that he employs non, like he employs guns, like literal guys with guns. Like that's his power, Um, which makes him very unique uh, amongst the crowd. I think if you have that and then just, you know, fault line crew, you just go, hey, neuter, why the hell are you here? And he goes, I don't know. Somebody paid us. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, and you don't say anything else about it. You just. You know, why are you here? I'm here because we got paid. Right. Yeah. Somebody footed the bill. That works. I like it. 
And then speaking of getting paid, let's cut to our sponsors. We want to thank the main sponsor for no. Oh, (laughs) what perfect timing! You know who won't professionals here? (laughs) You know who won't kid and drug? You know, kidnap and drug children most of the time. (laughs) The products and services that sponsor this podcast. (laughs) Insert sponsor here. You know, Empire eighty eight getting outed was really terrible. But, you know, your information doesn't have to get out to reveal that you're a hey. racist white supremacist supervillain with NordVPN. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, it's too easy. Too easy. <laughs> we got I mean, These sponsors. Sponsors. Yeah. These ads make themselves. <laughs> Come on. All right. Well, I think uh, that it just about wraps it up from everything I want to say. Um, I think the only thing, we kind of mentioned it, but I... But just ending strong on that cliffhanger, I think, is important. And uh, I think that just leads so cleanly into what are probably going to... I'm just going to go out on a limb. I know, I know a real, real shot in the dark here. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say, speculate, if you will, that we're going to need more than one episode for Arc 8. Um, <laughs> so... So I imagine we'll have maybe two more episodes left for our season one. I'll, I'll flip. I'll flip around on okay. that. I think. I think arc eight will be a shotgun blast of just oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> that we're just that's it. That's it. and then you're done. Like I, I think it's gonna be enough. It's just gonna be gushing. And then done. I think it's actually going to take less time okay. than our normal episodes because I don't think there's going to be that much. Uh, what's the word like nitpicking? Oh, fair enough. Yeah. No. Honestly, be, yep. You know what? I'm not even going to say because it it's next episode. But yeah, I think it's going to be less nitpicking and just reactions. You know what? You might be right. You might be onto something there. Anyway, uh, regardless, it's going to be a really exciting arc and a really fun end to this first hypothetical season of the uh, Worm Television Show. Heck yeah. Alan, thanks again for joining, as always. Jacob, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Thanks to our resident uh, audio editor slash director slash everything else that we need. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> mm. No problem. Thanks for making us sound good. And thank you all for listening. We really enjoy doing this. This has been a lot of fun. We're really getting into a groove. Um, and as always, let us know. What did we miss? Are we cutting the right stuff? Have we made a huge mistake here? We know there's a lot of worm the fans. No, <laughs> we've never made a mistake. <laughs> That's you're, you're right. You're right. We we haven't messed up, but uh, but you can tell us that we have if you think we did. Uh, we know there's a lot of passionate worm fans out there. We know we're probably um, ruffling some feathers and. Uh, Stepping on some toes, but that's what's fun about this. So let us know your thoughts. Have we cut too much? Have we cut too little? Have we completely forgotten something? I'm sure we have. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, reach out to us. Let us know what you think. And uh, stick around for Arc 8. You are not going to want to miss that one. Thank you so much for listening. Read along with us at parahumans.wordpress.com. We'd love to hear your thoughts. What did you love? What did you hate? Anything you think we missed, etc. as long as it's kind. If you'd like to get in touch, you can find us on Twitter, Threads, Instagram, TikTok, and Reddit at Brockton Bay BC or click the link in the description. <laughs>